Hello, and welcome to the Being Human podcast, where we explore what it means to truly be human, physically, mentally, and spiritually. On this seventh episode of the podcast, I sat down with Chris Radcliffe. Chris is an MMA fighter. We actually broke some news on the podcast that Chris will be making his pro debut some point next year. A date hasn't been set, but Chris fought his final amateur fight just last weekend on Golden Ticket. Um, It was for the title. He unfortunately came up short and we of course got into that and talked about that, but then also as well, what's next and what's next will be his professional mixed martial arts career. We talked about MMA, about Chris's journey through the sport, through his amateur career, through training. But what we also went into a lot were the challenges and circumstances that Chris has faced outside the cage, the people close to him have faced outside the cage. Chris was able to share insight on basically how to deal with life, how to hold the stoic perspective, as I call it, that he has. He is what I would call a modern day stoic in reference to the philosophy of stoicism. In Chris telling me the story of his partner's battle and his son's battle, I was not just inspired, but I have came away from this conversation with another level of gratitude for what I have in my life. I think anyone else who listens to the entirety of these stories will feel the same way. So I hope you not only enjoy this conversation, but find immense value in it as well. Please be sure to like the video, drop a comment below, share and hit that subscribe button as well. Thank you for watching and thank you for supporting Being Human. And and to start off, I, I want to thank you for for making the uh, the Being Human podcast studio very festive at this time of year. Yeah. It's actually Chris that um, uh, brought light to the fact that this is going to be the Christmas edition of Being Human and uh, probably the last one of the year as well. So, yeah, thank you for making awesome. it great. No, no, thanks for having me on. Very yeah. glad to be, um, to, to round off the year with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm very tempted by these mince pies, but I don't know if I'm skilled enough to be able to podcast and eat at the same time. But um, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, I didn't really think of that. Yeah, the chewing sound might be a bit off-putting to people. I they? mean, they'll be definitely be devoured afterwards. So yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll get round to them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I always say we've got to do the important stuff first. We had Nathan Togan on, and he gave his verdict on who has the best abs on the HW1 fight team, and you were named well, you and Marcus as kind of like top spot. Um, I was and, named first. Okay, so, so yeah. there we go. Okay, so you know, that's, he that's, said. Uh, he said, "Chris." That's implied that really. Oh, uh, Marcus. Kind of, you know, yeah, yeah. We'll have to have Marcus on and get get his take as well. We'll have to do a round table of um, HW one's uh, best abs, but yeah. Well, you, you gave you, you gave the people what they want. The abs are here. So, the, ab, yeah. the abs are here. You'll get them out on camera before we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, you know. I'm sure we'll go into this, but I fought last week and uh, abs were looking pretty nicely yeah, yeah. Uh, sliced and diced right well, before like the now. fight. Not good, mate. <laughs> all all the, the, the crevices are filled in now. Yeah, with, yeah. Uh, it, it doesn't the, take long, does it? Yeah, with all the, the merriness that I've been having since the fight because, uh, you know, it's that time of year, isn't it? Yeah, I know it is. It is. But I, I was going to ask you, let's hear it from the champ then, who... Next to you, of course, has the best abs on the HW1 fight team. You know, I thought Nathan was very humble not to, he was. He not was to mention humble. himself mm-hmm. because his are pretty oppressive. Yeah, so yeah. I, I've, I think I've pretty definitively got to give it to Togan. Yeah, I feel like that's going to be most people's answer. Yeah. So he, he was very humble not to, to mention himself. Yeah. So let's take it. We'll get to your fight last week, of course, but let's take it right back to the beginning. When did you start training MMA and what led you to start training? So the first time that I ever sort of came across MMA was, um, it was an ultimate fighter season and it was, it was perfect timing for me because it was the, the UK versus USA one okay. ages ago and it was coached by Michael Bisping and Dan Henderson. And that culminated in their fight where Dan Henderson did the did the H bomb yeah. and like fly and punch on on Bisping, and there was a guy on um, Bisping's team 
from Rochdale, which is where I'm originally from, a guy called Martin Stapleton. And he uh, owns and runs um, what is now SBG Rochdale up, up there. Um, and uh, I've trained with him before. Amazing coach, sort of guy, uh, former Bama champion when, when Bama was a thing. And, you know, he's like, he's sort of, um, he's like Jimmy-esque. In, yeah. in in sort of like being like a, a pioneer in, in that era um, and just like an all-around sort of guy, like former Royal Marine, just like legend. Um, so having seen him on the show, I was about, how old would I have been? I think I would have been about maybe 16, 17, around that sort of age, um, which is like very formative as like a, someone about to become a young adult. And um, I was already quite into um, boxing and martial arts, as it as it were, because uh, I uh, basically because I used to watch a lot of films like like Rocky, like um, Ali when it when it came out, mm. the Will Smith one. Uh, absolutely loved that film, and I just like I just put that on and just like shadow box in my room for two hours and stuff like that. And then eventually I found um, a gym nearby that. Uh, that did like an amateur boxing gym. Um, I never really competed. My mum in particular didn't really like it. She just wanted me to focus on school. So there was, you know, there was your, your mum and my mum would get along very well. Yeah, yeah. There wasn't, there wasn't, there wasn't so much um, discouragement as as much as there was just like not not very much encouragement towards it, and it was more encouragement towards the the academic side of things, um, which is fair enough because like you know. They were, Especially at that it, time. I mean, yeah. today it's still a pretty left field thing to do if you said to your yeah, parents, yeah, I want is. to go off and pursue fighting and get involved in fighting. But back then, trying to explain to them what MMA is, is cage fighting. It's yeah. two people, two animals fighting in a yeah, cage. Yeah, no, well, well, then then my, my um, ambitions were even a bit more mainstream than that. It was just boxing. But I think because um, uh, my mum's worked uh, for um, like domestic violence charities and she works for like a law firm now and she she meets a lot of people that have like um you know traumatic brain injuries and things like that so i think she's always like had that in the back of her mind whenever i've yeah. been uh, boxing or, or doing mma or anything like that but yeah so so started out boxing was like my love at, at, at the start and then saw this mma thing i was like oh this looks amazing and i had a couple of mates um that were quite into it as well and um then they uh, we we went to a play. It was just like a church hall where they just put a couple of mats down and they did like just a basic MMA session and a bit of grappling and stuff like that. And I was like absolutely just like overwhelmed, terrified by the whole thing. There was like this like short chubby guy that was just like tying us into knots and and stuff like that like he probably wasn't even that good you know he was probably, yeah. he was probably like not even a blue belt back then or something like that but you know he just like absolutely leathered us and um i didn't like it so like i kept on i kept on watching it but i didn't really um train it and then when i went to uh uni i was looking for a boxing club this is at loughborough uni they didn't have a boxing club at the time it was just kickboxing so i did that um you know got really into that uh competed it was kind of like uh like freestyle points kickboxing um some similar to like what uh what josh used to do josh yeah. hamilton but um probably not as not nearly as high level as he used to do it um because it was just like the university club and there wasn't an mma club yet at the time but sometimes at the the martial arts center at loughborough uni sometimes after our classes uh, see some some guys come in and um you know we'd start like like shrimping and stuff like that and we're like what's going on here and um it's like and, the strangest thing yeah to someone yeah that doesn't yeah. know the context exactly yeah the they came of it. they came in started doing started doing their shrimping started doing some pummeling and stuff like that like wrestling around doing some like striking drills as well and it's like oh yeah they must be doing mma and it was just um a guy who um had had competed before he was a, a student at the uni and they were basically just like bucking it out off their own backs and he was just like creating a, a little bit of a, a training session for for guys so i started doing them and then as i got to my later years at, at uni 
the MMA club, it became an actual club. And then Jimmy started. And that was the first time when I oh, met. Oh, okay. Because that's what I was going to ask. Yeah, and yeah. Then from when you started training, at what point did you then start training with Jimmy? So it was that's through when, the uni. That's when I first met Mr. Wallhead, yeah. Okay. So talk us through that. So, um... Sorry, uh, your mic's just a little bit off centre. Yeah. Try to point that. Better, do you reckon? Yeah, do I still just slowly off? Fiddly little things. How's that? <laughs> it doesn't seem to want to stay centre. Yeah, that looks good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so with, uh, with Jimmy, yeah, it was like my... My final year at uni, started training with Jimmy, and um, training was, um, to be honest, th thinking back on those training sessions, it's kind of uh, scary a little bit, like how similar the training sessions, from what I can remember, what they were then to where they are now. Really? And yeah, like going over a lot of the same stuff. And some of the stuff, like when he goes over it now, I'm still not like a hundred percent on it. Do you know what I mean? And he was like, he's doing this like over ten years ago. Like he he must have been like proper on the ball, like cutting edge with with this yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and he's just been like refining it over ten years. And I'm sure you know it's just my vague memory from years ago. He's like, I'm sure he's much much better. He will probably say that he's a much much better coach now than he was then. And it, his game has like evolved massively. Um, but I can. You know, there's like little touchstones in, in the memory of, of things that I can see that, that he did then that translates over to now. Um, so trained with Jimmy uh, at the uni on the uni classes for <coughs> about um, a year or two. And then um, after uh, I left uni, I went uh, abroad to uh, Houston, Texas with my, oh, really? with my um, now wife. Um, well, she became my wife right before before we went. Okay. Because she got a job in uh, at a British school, the British School of Houston, and um, she asked me if I wanted to go, and I said yeah. And uh, we needed to be married for me to get a spouse yeah, visa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so was... we did we did the whole green card sham marriage thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, like fifty quid registry office jobby. Did that, and uh, you know we've been together like over ten years now. So you know it, it stuck. Yeah. yeah. And um, so when we were out there, we um, well, I, I did a, a bit of training out there, uh, but that was sort of um, put on hold a little bit uh, when she uh, became quite ill. So she she's a little bit older than me. She, uh, she was. 29 I was 20 um 21 just about to turn 22 so she'd already sort of like been through uni and but she was still around because she was um like quite high level, high level um taekwondo black belt okay so she still did classes with the taekwondo club at uni and um so that's like how we how we got together because she came to kickboxing classes and stuff yeah. and um so when we were in Houston she was diagnosed with breast cancer so that sort of like put everything on hold then. We, we still stayed out in Houston because the, the care out there was really um, sort of cutting edge. And okay. um, they, they, do, they did treatments out there that they don't do on the NHS here. Um, very. And how did that, a little bit of a sign there, but how did that work with you? You guys obviously not being citizens. Did you? I imagine so, you're insured, right? Yeah. So, and so how with what was that to get insured? Was it expensive? It, it came with her her work. Okay. So, okay. so, so we got we got benefit yeah we got health insurance through through her work because obviously they don't have a national health system there. It would have cost us a massive amount of money. To be honest, it still did cost us a massive amount of money because they have these little things called copays. Okay. That um, you know, so you you still you pay a little bit before you sort of unlock the the insurance paying for the rest of it yeah kind of like an excess yeah, yeah yeah exactly so um a lot that was a lot of money and um but she um she started like a like a gofundme type thing of all the friends back home and that like people were so amazing so supportive like they you know they they, they gave us a lot and really helped us through that time 
fortunately, um, her work was still paying her, even though you know she wasn't going to school, she wasn't she wasn't teaching at the school uh, much when she was going through treatment because it was just too hard, and um, that was like that was a really tough time, and it really made me grow up because you got to think I'm like 21, 22. T- wow, turn, yeah. Turn 22 yeah. when we just got there. That's a young age to be. That that's an incredibly difficult situation to go through if you're at home, surrounded by your family. Yeah. You know, in a country you've lived your whole life that you're familiar with, familiar with the processes. To then have that situ- be in that situation in a completely different country, where I imagine things maybe work similar in the US, but still quite differently. Yeah. That yeah. must have been a, a very, well, yeah, like you said, a difficult situation to navigate and one which you'd either sink or swim in, I guess. Yeah, it's yeah, it was very lonely at times. You know, for, for the two of us, we, we were together, obviously, but um, it was very lonely at times. And uh, but at the same time, um, when we looked back on it, she said that um, I'm actually glad that we were out there and we could we could kind of just like isolate and get through it. When uh, when COVID came around. We were, we were actually thinking like we've we've done this before because um while she was going through chemotherapy she she had the whole lot so she had surgery to excise the the tumor mass itself um and and various bits where it had spread to she had um chemotherapy two two runs of chemotherapy and then um many many weeks of radiotherapy after that and during the the chemo the chemotherapy, her her white blood cell count was basically non-existent. Um, I think it's called neutropenia or something like that, where where the the immune system is just completely shot. Mm. So, I was sort of uh, in hindsight, I was behaving very similarly to like when when COVID first came about. You know, I'd like go to the supermarket, like <laughs> strip off my clothes, yeah, wash everything, yeah. and like being very conscious of. Um, like who I was around and how much. So yeah, so you can imagine at the time I wasn't I wasn't going to be training at all because like jujitsu is the worst thing. Yeah, yeah. Jujitsu or MMA is the worst thing that I could have been doing um, at that point. You know, not to, not to mention just the like I just need to be there to care for her anyway. So um, we did all that. We uh, we managed to save up some money because we weren't doing a whole lot during that period. Um, what were you doing? Were you able to work, or, or was your time dedicated to, so, to helping her and supporting her? So I was. I got a um, a work visa while I was out there, and I was going to start looking for work when everything like kicked off with her illness and treatment. Um, so then the I think to be honest, the the families and the the parents and stuff that that were there at the school, um, they're all basically uh, expats with oil companies very high paying okay. jobs and stuff like that and uh, they knew the whole story they knew what was going on um and um because i'd done uh, engineering before at university you know i know enough about maths to to help tutor their kids so um i was like a maths and science tutor just going like house to house at, at the weekend sometimes okay. yeah. and they'd pay That's me cool. it's probably the highest hourly rate that i've ever yeah, got yeah. in my entire life because they just like slip me like hundred dollar bills <laughs> like after every session it's like i've only been t- tutoring your kid for like an hour or two like you give me this much money they were like yeah, don't worry about it. yeah so they were extremely generous extremely helpful um to you know help us through that time um, but we, so we managed to save up money from her wage that she was fortunately still getting, and then the whole idea once once she was better was that um, we wanted to go to um, Thailand to Tiger Muay Thai where she'd been before, uh, and I hadn't been, and we always said that we were going to go, and um, you know after uh, like a, a brush, essentially a brush with death like that that, that she'd had. Um, she, you know, just wanted to do everything. So, you know, like we went anything on hold. Exactly. We, yeah, we went. We went traveling to places around America. We went to like Vegas and New York and stuff like that. We went um, traveling uh, a bit more sort of like traditional uh, travelery travels to um, Guatemala and Belize. We did that for for a few weeks, and then we went to um, Phuket to do Tiger. And we were there for about. 
um, like five or six months, split over two trips. We, we came back for Christmas, I think, Christmas and New Year to see family. Um, but we were there just like solid training. And it was there where, um, because of the level of the, the people that were there and um, because th that place was starting to get, I mean, it's extremely popular now and um, lots of very high level fighters go there for, for camps and things like that. You've got like the city kickboxing guys from, from New Zealand that go, loads of um, guys from Dagestan go. I, like, I think of it like it's basically like they're Spain to us. You yeah, know what I mean? yeah. <laughs> so I guess like, it is. Yeah, yeah. like they you know fly fly down to um, like Southeast Asia, and um, so went down there like absolutely amazing talent there to see. Uh, like people around the gym know that like I probably um, know me as like lo loving a name drop. So like when uh, when I was there before they were in the UFC. Pete Yan was there. Oh, really? He was there at that point? Yeah. Valentin Shevchenko was there. Okay, wow. Um, Volkanovsky was there. Dan Hooker was there. Yeah. yeah. So, I got, so I got to see those guys <laughs> trading. <laughs> My way. Yeah. I got to and see obviously, it. this was before any of them were in the UFC, right? Before any of them were in the UFC. Wow, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, so yeah. did you know who they were? But say, to say, did you know who they were? They weren't the UFC, you know, the UFC stars at that point. No. Well, yeah, did, did know, you know they were a big deal, or was it? Yeah. were they? Did yeah. they have a reputation at that point that they were on the come up and big things were expected? Yeah, the, like the the coaches, because um, the coaches were mostly American guys, the MMA coaches, mostly um, American guys, and they very deep into the into the MMA world, so they know like yeah, who's who's on the come up, they who's, who's really good. Yeah, they could see and they knew and like and I could um, once I found out their their names and stuff, I could like. YouTube their their records and stuff like that. So like um, Peter Yan, he was on um, what was it called? Like ACB was it called? Uh, the, yeah, that yeah. rings a bell. Um, I just remember it has like the cut in in the name mm. or something like that. Um, Russian MMA organization, and he was like the the champion there. And uh, yeah, so I could see him fighting on that. Um, Valentina, because my my wife was there, and there's not there's not that many females that go there as a proportion compared to yeah. men, obviously. So, um, you know, sometimes when we do jujitsu, like Valentina would like partner with her and stuff yeah, like that. Wow. And, and like sort of, you know, took a little bit of a shine to her because she was a, a female in that environment. So talked to her a lot and got to know like how much of a big deal she was and that she was on the come up and stuff. Um, yeah. Volkanovsky, like sort of guy, dead, dead funny. Uh, he was really good friends with, um, uh, another British MMA fighter called uh, Sean Walsh, who was a former Bama champion, who we got quite friendly with because he's British and he was doing his fight camps out there. Um, and now you can usually see, um, I said Sean, Shane, Shane Walsh. He, uh, he um, now you see him sort of on the sidelines, if not in his corner, in Volkanovski's corner a lot of the times. Okay. They're, they're really good friends yeah. um, and train with each other a lot. So yeah, got got to see all those guys. Got to see that level of talent and and see. Gives you a bit of perspective to see like what it takes to be at that level. Do you know what I mean? Um, especially to say like when they're on the when they're on the come up, and that's when they're probably like working the hardest to to sharpen the skills. Pean just like took the piss out of everyone with how he how he moved inspiring and stuff like that. He was just like in the matrix. Just taunting he, everyone. It was just mad, you know, throwing like cartwheel kicks, like nobody could touch him. Even when we were doing like warm ups and stuff, we'd do like, like inchworms across the mat and he'd just do like an inchworm fucking backflip and you know, crazy athleticism, like unbelievable to, to see. Um, but yeah, in, in that environment, um, because I felt like, you know, I was still young, but um, having had a yeah, little bit how, of time off. How old were you at this point? Um, 20, 23, 24, something yeah. like that. Um, Daniela's treatment took, uh, all told, it probably took about like a year to 18 months to like be done with everything. So we spent we spent about two years in all. In, um, she spent two full like school years at, um, in, Houston, in Houston. And then, uh, and then we um, went off, started traveling and stuff like that. And um, so 
when uh, because I'd, I felt like I'd sort of lost a step, so to speak, like I, like I was behind, like I was catching up. I already kind of felt like that anyway, because, you know, people who become world champions usually start when they're like in their early teenagers and stuff like that. So I was like, if I'm going to try and get anywhere, then I've got to get good yeah, fast. You feel the urge and so massively overtrained. <laughs> <You know? laughs> because the thing is, uh, when you go to these um, training camps in, in Phuket, uh, or, you know, they're sort of popping up all over the place now. Um, our friend Perry will probably be going to one in, yeah, uh, in I Bali. Yeah, we'll be there in a few he? weeks. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I think there's like, there's a, yeah, the MMA camp drop, popping up around like the Philippines and stuff like that now in Indonesia. And um, like just following their model, basically, because they've become so successful. Uh, and you can essentially train from like, 8 a.m. until 8 p.m. if you want to okay. and just go from class to class to class to class to class you know you could do like sunrise yoga and then <laughs> you can jump or I think the earliest class to start was like 7 a.m. and it was like a three hour Muay Thai session um so it'd go, yeah it go from <laughs> three hour Muay Thai session from, yeah yeah it wasn't like it wasn't not, like, not, it, not like it, yeah. intensive the whole yeah, time yeah, yeah. so breaking you, down techniques the first like the first, the first 30 40 minutes you just like running around the camp okay Getting a, getting a sweat on, you get a sweat on, even at 7 a.m. Yeah, like, you yeah. get a sweat on. I bet. And, um, and then, uh, yeah, like pad work, bag work. They do, like, they had a little bit of the session where um, you're doing, like, it was kind of like a wrestling session, but, but in the clinch. So you're doing, like, foot sweeps and, like, catching kicks and trips and things like that. So they'd show a few bits of that. And then, um, like, some sparring at the end, uh, pretty much every session. So, you, proper Thai style like light sparring you know because they the guys are, the way that they train they spar really heavy but they don't do they no they no. spar quite light they, they fight like every weekend yeah if, you, so if you're a, if you're a jobber if you're a jobber Muay Thai fighter in Thailand you, you're fighting pretty much every weekend because mm. that's your that's like your paycheck for the week do you know yeah, what I mean? yeah and you know same as in every sporting endeavor you can think of 95% of them aren't making a whole lot you know, so like they've got to, they've got to make sure they're in that ring. That's also why you'll probably see when you see, when you don't, not the like championship level Muay Thai fights, but you'll see, uh, you get a lot of like finishes and a lot of knockouts because you can see the guys aren't like, they're not out, but they've, they've taken a really hard shot and yeah. they'll, they'll just so go, they're, they're they'll just go it. down because they're like, I've got fight again next week. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Which, you know. It's like totally understandable, you know, if you're not fighting for a for a massive prize or for a a, a belt or something like that, there's no point, and you know you're going to be fighting this week, next week, and every week after that. Then yeah, take it easy, and yeah, and their their training reflects that as well. So they they spar really light, really technical, um, because it's a a camp where a lot of like. Westerners go and a lot of non-Thai people go. People get a little bit overzealous and a little bit heavy. So sometimes the Thai traders would just come in if I was sparring with someone and the person was getting a little bit heavy with me. The Thai trader would come in and just like shout at them in Thai, like da, 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 and then like slapping them around the head, basically telling them like like calm down, you freak, like stop it. <laughs> this, oh, wow. this isn't this isn't how we train. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that, that's uh, that that was a amazing experience and we, we have been back since actually since we had um our son as well we took him when when he was a, a baby which uh obviously a lot less training got done which was probably a good thing because like i said i'm massively overtrained. i was like so skinny back then i was getting like staph infections all the time because my oh, immune system okay. was just yeah, shot yeah. really easily done out there even though they you, know, you, hear, they, you hear so many stories about people yeah. getting staff out there i mean it happens everywhere of course but yeah. um I've heard some horror stories about people getting I mean, just in that tropical climate. Yeah, it's so humid. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really, really easy to get. And uh, even though they're, they're religious about, uh, they've got like a, an army of like cleaning ladies, basically, that come on and, and debt all the mats, like every after every single session, you know, and the, the, after every single session, they are like drenched in sweat. Mm. You know, so and they're they, open air gyms as well, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. O- open and air. still. Still happens. So I was lucky enough when the first time we went to Tiger, um, I got to see it like sort of how it originally was, and it was basically all kind of 
like made out of like bamboo and stuff like that and um the uh, and they just had like a bunch of proper old dirty blue like puzzle mats that the training sessions happen and they'd have like a few rings that were all like decrepit and super old um and obviously at some stage while we were going there it was getting more popular got a lot of investment put into it and uh, so like sections of the the gym or like the land that the, the gym was on um started because it's sort of like surrounded by a it's got like a main road next to it but then it's sort of like surrounded by a like a forest or like a plantation or something around it and bits of that started being cleared and then bits of the gym were like sort of unavailable to be trained on because they they'd clear it all out like bulldoze all like the the bamboo part of it and stuff like that and then um put this like really nice uh like concrete slabs down and stuff like that and then they get the new mats in built these big steel frames um for the for the roof because yeah it's all open air but they've got like a steel frame uh roof over the top of it um because it rains like yeah. crazy yeah. out there when it when it rains it proper pours out there um but yeah you can train when it's when it's pouring like that because they've got the they've got the roofs over it and they did the same thing that um like up some steps they did the same thing like for the open air sort of mma bit and things like that. and we got to see that all sort of like being built which was pretty cool yeah well so you really got to see its development from yeah, being yeah. well from its origins to where it is today which is now really it's one of the premier mma it's not even just a camp anymore lots of fighters are full-time fighters out there i think yeah if you know, Deanne still trains there as his his main that, that's yeah his they've, they've got their they've got their team yeah um, yeah that's his team that's they, his they, they sponsor people they do like trials every every now and again where they'll take a bunch of like up and coming fighters and, and put them through um a trial what one year um because you know i'd been there a while and um although i didn't have like an mma record or anything but you know i was i was training with the guys and coaches knew me and um they said, i was gonna say did you get like much drilling in and, and any rounds at all with like yeah yeah they, the they said like they said like come come stuff. jump on and, and train with the with the guys yeah and uh that was like i wasn't quite ready for that because um these guys were like either at the very bottom very high level amateurs if not pros and you know dan hooker was there as well and he, yeah. he was one of the people that got the the contract even though they were going to give him a contract anyway to be like a signed on fighter he wanted to do the the trial anyway to sort of show that he's like one of the one of yeah. the team sort of yeah, thing. Like, he wanted to go like, through yeah. the same thing and it was like i wouldn't say it was like easy for him but if it was easy for anyone it was easy for okay. him, do you know what i mean yeah. it was the easiest for him out of everyone else um because he was like you know head and shoulders above everyone but uh, yeah so I, I went and they they let me do some of the sessions with them um and the like the intensity was so high because these guys are like competing for places so I wasn't quite ready for it, and got like dinged about a little bit. Um, but you know, it was good, good experience. Yeah. But you, know, you actually like, you sparred with Fuko. Um, I think I did. I think I did one round with him during a sparring thing, and he was just like being dead playful, dead yeah. nice with me, like nothing, you know, nothing really to to write home about. Yeah, you know yeah. I mean? He's just Not like some legendary gym war. No, no, no. He could, he could have like smashed. I'm sure he could have like smashed me at any point. Him. Yeah. <laughs> He could have smashed me at any point if he wanted to, but he was just like being being playful and nice. Yeah, and, a cool, yeah. cool experience nonetheless. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah really yeah. cool. Yeah, and um, yeah, there's a bunch of guys that I've seen like fighting the UFC that are like, I was like, oh yeah, I remember when I did a uh, like a wrestling class and I was his drilling partner and stuff like that. There was um, there was one guy, uh, Merbeck Tysonov. I don't know if you. Oh, Tysonov. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, there was like. I, I like partnered with him a bunch of times had no idea who he was but i could tell that he was like good dagestani absolute phenom at wrestling uh but he was like very nice very good at drilling with me like just gave me tips in all the little positions and stuff i think he just took the session with me as like like a rest session but he was yeah. still but you know he was still drilling with me really well and stuff like that he wasn't sort of like oh this fucking guy do you know what i mean it was it was really cool yeah, yeah. so Having that experience, going to that place, seeing that level, um, yeah, put things into perspective of like just how good these guys are and like what what it takes to to get there. Mm. So then, obviously, you came back. When did you come back to England? Um, would have been two thousand and sixteen. 
um, full t- sort of like the March April of 2016. That's where we would have finished off like our last trip to yeah. to Thailand. Yeah, and then so you've um, been away for two years, two, wait, two, wait, two in, and a half. Yeah. In, in total, it was about seven, eight years, right? Or how long it, between? So so you went to Houston. Went, went to, to, went, to went to Houston in like 2013. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, twenty thirteen summer of summer of twenty thirteen. I turned um, twenty two just after we got out there, and then yeah, it was the the early part of twenty sixteen when we had our last trip to Thailand. Yeah, so it was about yeah almost three years sort of yeah out of the country traveling around, and then it was all about like right, what we're we gonna do now? Where we're we gonna live? Um, <laughs> like the the money's kind of all, yeah, all but yeah. run out. They kind of um, like not back to reality, but it's like yeah, okay, yeah. We're coming back home now, it's a completely different scenario. Yeah, a little bit. And at the time, because of everything that Daniela had gone through, she was like, "I'm I'm like retired now. I'm like I'm not. I, I don't want to have to like go back to work Live again." To work. But that yeah. But then I think as the as that like reality kind of hit home, she was like, okay, I'm going to have to work, but it's going to work is going to work for me. I'm going to make, make yeah. whatever career I have, it's going to be like, like part time. And I'm going to spend the majority of the time doing the things that I want to do. On her in terms. My life. Yeah, exactly. On her terms. So, um, we came back, we were sort of going back and forth between like our parents for a bit, deciding like, where we want to live. We ended up sort of like in between. She's originally from Leamington Spa. I'm originally from Rochdale. We both met, okay. we met in, yeah, in yeah. Loughborough. So Which we were is like- really kind of an exact midpoint. It's, yeah, almost, almost, yeah. Is and Rochdale near Manchester? It's, correct, it, it? Yeah, it's greater Manchester. Yeah. So it's about, I don't know, like 10 miles north of it or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, it's in, the, it's in the greater Manchester sort of ring. Um, and yeah, so we we eventually decided on yeah let's let's stay in Loughborough and uh, I looked for um, a gym here had had uh, a mate from university who um, did kickboxing with us and he did uh, a little bit of MMA as well um, and he he'd started doing MMA at a gym um, in Loughborough that they don't do MMA now they just do sort of like traditional martial arts. Um, but at the time, they were sort of like trying to build up a team kind of thing. So when I came back from... Was this John Skillings? No, no. Um, this was... Uh, it was called 360 MMA. So oh, was, so yeah, Jack, yeah. So Jack, 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 Jack Kenshaw Adam. started that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's where I met all those guys. Okay. E- Ella as well. Ella yeah. was there first. And um, Danielle. You know, Danielle Hutton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, she was there as well. So we all met each other there. And, um, and at some we, point, Jimmy abducted you all. <laughs> well that kind of that place kind of started like falling apart a little bit and then everybody went off I, I went off sort of like on the early side of things because we actually um moved away to nottingham for for a bit first so i was training at, at not so MMA for a bit which is where i met riley and stuff and and um training with like paul and and, and dean uh, and dean. I dean was kind of like in the yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Dean was, um, yeah, Dean was there. Engage Warriors, um, getting close to the title. Shane as well. Shane, yeah. Shane was like a blue belt then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Still beat the fuck out of me. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but he was a he was a blue belt then, and um, he, uh, yeah. So we were there for a year, and um, right behind not so MMA is um, CrossFit gym, and uh, Daniela started doing CrossFit there, and I I do um, a bit there as well for like SNC. And that's, you know, like sort of chop and change between like going between the two gyms sometimes. And then um, Jimmy would bring the guys up sometimes. Got to um, knots. Up to knots for sparring. So I saw him again and uh, he remembered me from when we were at, uh, when I was training with him at uni. Jimmy's incredibly good at remembering people. He is, yeah. Oh, I've, I've never seen him like forget someone, even re forget someone's name, but especially faces, he won't forget. And you got to think, when he's you know, someone. he's like he's like a local legend. Like everybody knows him. He's yeah, probably, like the amount he's of people pretty, that... he's probably met thousands and thousands yeah, of people. Yeah, but yeah, he's really good. Yeah, at that. he remembers everyone. Yeah. yeah, which is which is good when you see him again, and it's like, oh yeah, yeah, great. he remembers it's me. Good we've feeling. got we've got like a you know we've got like a connection there. So I, so I thought. Um, we were going to move back to 
Loughborough. This was after like a year or so of living in Nottingham. This is actually when um, Daniela found out she was pregnant. We were like, because we were living in a little little box flat in, in Nottingham, we were like, this is not going to do. Yeah. So <laughs> let's move back down to Loughborough where we can get a bit of a bigger place for the same sort of money. Um, and uh, so I wanted a place to, to train down there. And uh, yeah, Jim, Jimmy was there. So that's when he was training out Skillings. So so I went and started training with those guys when we when we moved down. I think in the in some somewhere in the the transition period, I did uh, um, a couple of fights on Jimmy's promotions as well. When he did Fight UK, yeah. I did a couple of fights there because initially fighting for that that old gym, I had an amateur record of zero and two because I wasn't being matched up correctly. Um, and uh, also, we, it was basically like a, a traditional martial arts gym, uh, like a like a taekwondo type, type of thing. So the the coach knew like some striking, but we didn't really have any ground. So that's where I ended up losing. So I lost two decisions in my first two fights, and then um, Jimmy matched me up with some guys. I was training with him, and I ended up at, at two and two. And then I was like, right, we're starting now. This is I'm back at. I'm basically back at nil nil as far as I was concerned, yeah. you know what I mean? And then after a little while, Jimmy opened up the first Hardy Wallhead mm-hmm. and then sort of like the rest is history there. Yeah, yeah. 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 Been training with him ever since. And um yeah, but how many amateurs later? Like I think that last one was my what was it? Uh my ninth. So yeah, like another another three or four amateurs later. Yeah, here we are. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah, let's talk about that. Last weekend, uh, 9th of December? Yeah. 9th of December, you fought on golden ticket for the bout. This was your t- second title shot because you fought for the bout last year as well, didn't you? It, yeah, yeah. So yeah. It, was, it was last uh, like June or something and then I had a layoff due to injury because I fractured my cheekbone in that fight. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was an absolute war. So that, yeah. yeah. It, a, a great fight to watch, obviously. I say concerning fight to watch, obviously, in terms of... When it's your t- when you watch a war like that, usually, and it's not one of your teammates, or you think, oh, wow, this is amazing. Yeah. But obviously, when it's your teammate, there's obviously a certain amount of concern. Like, I don't want them to be all right. This is a really entertaining fight to watch, but I also don't want to see them take too much damage. Yeah, it's hard when it's someone that you know, isn't it? Because Yeah, you know, yeah. If it's back Part, and forth, part of you just wants more violence and the other yeah. part's like, <laughs> I want it to be all right. <laughs> yeah, as, as like the back and forth happens in an even fight like that, if it's someone that you know, it's like the, the bits where it's not going their way, it like it, it hurts that much yeah. more, doesn't it? And then when when it's going that way, you're like, yeah, come on. And then it's like, oh no, yes, oh, no. yeah. It's really, yeah, really, it's conflict- a roller coaster. really conflicting, isn't it? Yeah. No, yeah. It, was, it was it was a tough fight. Went all the way to um, decision that one against uh, Mikey Tranter. He was called the uh, incumbent champion uh, who won. And yeah, really good fight. I, and a, I was, and a very close fight as well. Yeah, I was I was quite I was relatively happy with my. My performance. There was a lot that we, I could uh, take away and and improve on, and um, yeah, I, I I just wanted to work to get back to to doing another title shot, pretty much like straight away after. Even though you know, obviously, I had the the layoff due to the the injury. I had to have surgery to repair my um, to repair my cheekbone, and um, then but that. It was kind of good because uh, then I just focused on like grappling for a bit. So that was the first thing that I could do once once I was sort of ready to train again, um, and then just got really into doing um, like gi and no gi t- together. Got and then, your purple and then belt. I got my purple belt that uh, that winter at the winter grading. Um, so that was good. Like sort of showed my progress, gave me a lot of confidence, and then started like almost building my striking game back up from scratch a little bit because I hadn't been doing hardly done any sparring um so like having jimmy there to teach you when you're sort of like pulling everything back and then starting from scratch is just amazing because i feel like it i i I surpassed where i was very very quickly and Mm. and i feel feel like i've sort of like gone gone you didn't feel like you'd lost a step yeah and then obviously that showed in my last fight yeah in in september you came back in september yeah which was which went extremely well I mean, a dominant victory against the guy was from Renegade, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, I think he undefeated prospect. Yeah, he was two and zero. Oh, yeah, two and zero, oh, and 
you put on a boxing clinic and then took him down in the second round and got what is now kind of your signature or in the gym, it's your signature. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm going to start calling it the Von Radcliffe. <laughs> I like that. But you've got, like to, move, you've got yeah. to move a Von Flew. I don't know if it quite has the ring of the Von Flew, but, um, well, but I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> Get a few more on your record and then, you know, we're, I, I don't know how yeah. many is Von Prue, um, not Von Prue, what's his name? St. Prue. Oh, Ovin St. Prue. He had a, quite a few, so. I think he's, I think he definitely got two or three. At least two. So yeah, if you get two. four out, you know, yeah. out in actual fights, then I think we we can stake okay. the flag. That's as a, it being the Von Radcliffe. Yeah. All right, that's that's the aim. That's, that's the goal. goal. Let's yeah, do yeah. It. The only problem is if anyone listens to this before uh, you fight them, they'll no. uh, they'll have an idea that it's coming. So yeah, okay. Might have yeah. to <laughs> might have to release this after I've done four <laughs> of <Yeah>. these jokes. <laughs> but but yeah, that's to say that you bounced back, had a great win in September, finished the guy with the von flu, and then that set you up for this title fight um, last week. Yeah, with Jordan Little. How did you feel going into the fight? What was the game plan? How did you feel training camp had been? Yeah, tear, teared up for us. So, t- so training camp, coming off of that that last fight, you know, bags of confidence, feeling really good. Um, training camp generally going really well. I mean, you can, in hindsight, with the fact that I lost that fight, um, you know, the, everything goes through your mind as like, oh, maybe that's the reason, maybe that's the reason, maybe that's the reason. But um, ultimately, I'll, I'll come to like my view on that. I think. Yeah. Um, so doing doing back, it was pretty much back to back training camps. I think I had like a a week or two off before going straight into the training camp for this one, and um, it's hard. It's 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 hard um, on your body. It's hard on your your mind when you're sparring all the time and sometimes not doing as well as you feel that you should. Um, and it's also hard just just in your general life, especially when I've got a, a young family as well. I've got and, and I, I work. Uh, I'm a teacher, so um, quite a lot of sort of like responsibilities that I'm that I'm juggling in the air at once. And then to sort of increase the the training after I've just been doing it a couple of weeks ago before, it's uh, it's a lot to take on. So um, Training camp's always always hard to to juggle, but I think you know it, it's kind of the it's kind of the, the same for everyone. I think. I mean, obviously, if you don't have as many responsibilities, it, it's maybe a bit easier, but it's still stressful. Um, One thing I wanted to ask is because usually everyone from the gym gets matched up on the same card or mm-hmm. as much as possible. So usually, when you're in camp you have at least two or three other guys in the gym who are in camp for the same card. So you're going through camp together. Mm. You were the only fighter from our gym on this golden ticket card. Yeah. Did that in any way make training camp more difficult, either physically or mentally? Um, Did it feel more lonely in any way? Yeah, I think maybe even though it was a, you know, it was, it was a title fight, and uh, there's there's a bit of buzz that sort of comes with that. Um, it felt like maybe there was a little bit less buzz just because yeah, other there weren't other people from the gym. It wasn't like a whole gym thing. It, it was just me. And that, it definitely creates uh, more morale with the team. You know what I mean? Yeah. When you've got like two, three guys, you know, something like it's five, uh, you know, five, six, yeah. seven guys. Well, on I the, think like the, the I think the the biggest we've ever had back at the old place. I think we had one card where there was going to be like. Like eight or nine, oh, I think it was something 10. like that. Ultimately, yeah. lots of fights fell through, and I yeah, think yeah, it, it ended up being like five. It ended up, it, no, I think it ended up being like two or three. Okay, but it, it but started, there, were, there were ten. It started, ten as, fights yeah, in the it started gym as ten. Yeah, this is the this is the amateur game. Like fighters are so flaky. As as I've had nine amateur fights, I've probably been booked about twenty times. Yeah, you know what I mean. So. Um, yeah, this is just the average game. Like people aren't being paid. Like they they can flake out for whatever reason. So yeah, that's that's just the way it goes. So yeah, I think um, yeah, there was maybe a little bit less of a less of a gym buzz. But you know, I try. I I don't think I'll let that sort of um, distract me or detract me from from training from training. From, from the outside looking in, it didn't look as though it affected you at all, regardless no. of whether it. You know, felt lonelier or I didn't feel like there was much as much of a buzz. Um, 
Yeah, Some, on the outside looking in, you, you, you were just as dedicated as you always yeah, are. Yeah, I was always going to be training. I, I train whenever I, whenever I can, whenever it's, you know, um, like whenever I can get all my ducks in a row and everything as, as much as I possibly can. So, it, it, yeah, I, I don't think it helped. I don't think it um, took away in that way from like the amount that I was training or anything like that. Uh, maybe in some sessions, maybe the intensity that would have been training if I was going against people that were also fighting maybe. Yeah. But then on the other side of it, um, I had a little bit more personal attention as well from like Jimmy and Joe because I was the only That's one. That's true. So, so yeah. it swings and roundabouts, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Um, I think also, as I was saying, I'll sort of like come back to what my all round um reflection all around reflection is on on the preparation i think you you look at the fight and maybe by the time this comes out people can can watch it on youtube it's not out just yet um but i've watched it back because uh somebody in the who was in the crowd recorded it and it's like i was winning that fight man i was winning that fight and i got caught so i can i can go back and reflect and justify it however i want but I was doing well. There were things in the fight that I should have been doing that I didn't. Um, and uh, in a, in a, a moment of uh, sort of overzealousness or, or, or just absent-mindedness, I was in his guard. I didn't realize how long he'd has, had his hand on my wrist. And then it got stuffed and he got the triangle and I got caught and it happened. It's happened loads of times in training. It'll happen loads of times again, you know, and that's the way it goes up until that point I was winning the fight. I could have been winning more dominantly if I, if I did the things that, that we should have done. I think, what, what do you think? Cause I, I've watched it back and I, obviously I'm biased, hmm. you know, being your teammate, but um, you know, for me, that was your fight. And like you said, a mistake cost you. It's not as though, you know what I mean, it was a fight that could have gone either way. You were in control and yeah. yeah, it was a moment. He had a moment, he capitalised on it. Yeah. So w- what do you think was going well specifically that uh, enabled you to build up the lead you had over the, because it was the fourth round, wasn't it? Fourth, yeah. That you yeah. got caught. So like what, what, what were you doing before, well? Yeah. What were you doing right, so to speak, um, that enabled you to win those rounds? And then what were you not doing, as you just said? That you should have been doing so right off the bat i think well just generally in in fights where you're winning um i don't quite know how else to describe it but it feels like um you have like a foothold somewhere in, in the fight whether that's um like a a technique that you kind of not necessarily repeatedly going back to, but but you have an idea of how someone is gonna react when you do a certain thing, and it feel it feels like a foothold. It feels like it's some like a little foundation, bit, a little foundation that you're starting to build up your your attacks off of and things like that. And I, during the fight, I didn't feel like I had a foothold at any point. It all it all felt a little bit chaotic. Um, and you know, props to him. I think that's I think that's what he does. I think that's where he thrives. So quite uh, an, orth- an unorthodox style, very unorthodox yeah. style. And I think if you watch, you know, because he's fought some very good guys and um, won some, lost some, but um, he, I think he always makes people look worse than they actually are because of his unorthodox style. And I think also because like he just. He just lives in that chaos. He just like creates like a maelstrom, and um, like he's he's got quite like quick um, reactions. Like you know, he's he's going like technique to technique to technique and things like that. And like everything might not be like super clean and super effective, but he's like he's kind of just like overwhelming you a, a little bit. That's I mean. It's not kind of like the standardized structured systems yeah. that you get when you face fighters from certain gyms, which. Like you said, it means that some things aren't quite as polished and they don't flow as nicely, but it also has the effect of making things a lot more unpredictable yeah. in a way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, you see he comes out and he's throwing, like, crazy kicks straight away and, you know, they might they might not be the most dangerous, but they're 
they get your mind thinking about they those put kicks. you off the rhythm yeah, and, yeah. off your rhythm sorry yeah they put you off a little bit and uh, I think uh, yeah kind of like I don't know um, at the same time again it, it's it's that same thing of like you know I could say like oh he was like kind of snake charming me a little bit hypnotizing me with all this stuff that he was throwing at me but like I was actually doing quite well, <laughs> so yeah. even though I feel like I didn't, I didn't quite have a um, a foothold. It, you were winning nonetheless. Yeah, yeah. It, it was what I was doing was working, and um, where I felt I was strong was um, in the in the striking. I feel like uh, his his craziness wasn't like getting through too much I think he like he hit me with like a wild left hook at some point and that like woke me up a bit and then sort of didn't didn't hit me with that again um and I was like working my way in when I was throwing strikes he was kind of like like looping around so I wasn't as accurately accurate as I would would like to have been but that opened up like a, a big head kick that I landed at the end of the first round as well um in the clinch I felt strong um I think I wasn't reacting very well on off his takedown attempts, and even though he didn't like straight take me down, uh, he could like push me to the fence and then work from there. And that's where I, I felt like he was like it almost felt like he was like hustling me a little bit. He, he was he was ready to take it to like an intensity that I don't know in a weird way I wasn't quite like pre prepared for or something like that. And I thought back on it, and pe you know, people thought in the build-up to the fight that I was, you know, it was I was like a shoe in. I was definitely gonna win, and I tried to like put that completely out of my mind and come to it like this guy's like serious challenge. I want to come to it like he's a he's a world beater, and I've got to I've got to beat him. But I think maybe in the, in the fight, the those thoughts of like um, I. Uh, I don't know. I, I like deserve this, or or I, um, I'm. I know I'm. I'm better than this guy. I should beat this guy. Yeah, I, I should. I should beat <coughs> this guy. Excuse like me. maybe took away that like intensity a little bit. That from if you juxtapose it to my last fight, I didn't know very much about that guy. I just know it was two and zero, and he like knocked out two guys from a great gym, from a really good gym. Um, and like for all I knew, he's like the next like renegade prodigy on on the up, and you know he's just like stuff on his record with like highlight reel finishes, and I'm going to be one of them or something. Which, to an extent, I kind of like at some point when you're fighting, especially in amateurs against unknown people, you have to like take your hand off the wheel at some point and be like the the chips yeah. are fall where they may. You know, because you know, you know, I've done everything I can do. Them. I don't know how I don't know that much <coughs> about him. Me. I don't know how good he is. Yeah, let's just have a ding dong and see what happens. Um, and I feel like almost that's that's like the healthiest place to be. Maybe maybe I knew like too much about um, Jordan because like he's very experienced. He's had a lot of fights. I've seen a lot of him, uh, a lot of uh, tape on him and things. Thought he looks very beatable and maybe that like sunk in a little bit too much um again i always keep coming back to like yeah but yeah but you were winning the fight do you know what i mean and mm. you and you got caught so who knows you know what i mean it's 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 one of those it's the um the ufc used to bring out these videos after each event and they're called the thrill and the agony yeah 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 it, it made me think of those when i think we exchanged with the messages organizing this, and you said, uh, talk about the thrill and the agony. The thrill and the agony. Yeah. It's the yeah. thrill and the agony. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's like that, that phrase works on so many levels because it's, it's like the perfect phrase, isn't the, it? The thrill and the agony like happens within the fight. The, the fight is thrilling and the fight is agonizing, uh, you know, because you can go through a lot of pain while you're in there. But it's like the thrill and the agony is like the, the win and the loss as well. Yeah. You know, you see you see that thrill and the agony straight after the fight finishes when somebody gets the hand raised and the other person doesn't. Yeah. And I'm just like, yeah, last week I've just been feeling the agony a little bit and just trying to um, trying to process it. Do you know what I mean? So it's as, I, as I've been told, you know, straight after the fight, I got told by Jimmy, 
who's had his wins and losses massively experienced at the highest level, Dean as well, they were like, it's part of the game. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll feel it for a bit and then you'll get back on it and you'll, it'll go away. You know, that feeling will, will go away and um, you can just build and improve off of it. And uh, that's what I plan to do next. So that was my, that was my final amateur fight. Okay, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah, yeah, that's what yeah. I was going to ask next. next? <laughs> I anticipated your next yeah. question. Yeah, yeah. So that, yeah, that that all so it was always the plan. news, right? I mean, yeah. we kind of knew it was coming, but officially world exclusive breaking news. Yeah, world on exclusive. Being human, on being human. Breaking news. <laughs> so you're going pro next? I'm going pro. Yeah, next. yeah, yeah. That was always the plan. It was actually going to be the plan after the fight in September. I was going to turn pro then, but I was like because that performance went so well and. Um, Clayton, the uh, War FM uh, uh, management, yeah, uh, kind of like guys, the, the gym's he's, flight he's, manager. Yeah, he sorts out our our um, he sorts out our our matchups and things like that. Um, and he he got straight on to um, Dan uh, Cassell at, at GTFP and said like Christopher title next, and he was like yeah yeah, yeah. No, no problem. Um, and so I was like, yeah, it, it would be really nice to, and it was kind of like, uh, not, you know, it's not something that I put on like a vision board or anything like that, but it was something that I thought would be nice to, in my, in my amateur stint to get a belt yeah, off, off of promotion. And I'd already had a go at it and it didn't work. Um, and then had a really good fight and I thought, yeah, let's, let's have another go. Let's roll the dice again. Um, you know, against this opponent that I thought I should beat. So I was like, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good about this. But um, yeah, never mind. Didn't mm. didn't pan out that way. So just looking forward to, to pro. And you never know, Jordan's turned pro as well. So there might be a oh, re really? rematch okay. on the cards yeah, at yeah. some point. You never know. Yeah, yeah, rematch for the pro title. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah so so when, when, you, when will you be looking to uh, make your pro debut? It will be on Golden Ticket, will it? Or um, are, you, are you not really... Not really thought on that yet. Not really thought about it. Um, I know Jimmy's thinking about at some stage putting on another show. Yeah, it might be the back end of next year though. I might want to um, fight before then, maybe like mid next year, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so not really taking any kind of like prolonged time before the debut, just because I suppose no, at no. this point you. you you, like you said, you've had nine amateur fights, and obviously there are differences. You know, the uh, say there are differences. The elbows, other than the elbows, well, what differences uh, are there? So really there's, between there's the rule sets? elbows are now allowed. Knees to the knees head. to the head. Sorry, knees to the head. And yeah. um, there's uh, certain submissions that that are allowed. Yeah, they, Twi the heel twisted hooks. submissions like yeah, heel yeah. hooks, uh, twisters, all that kind of stuff. Um, and also, um, one thing that people who watch the sport probably don't have an appreciation for is um the the referees the oh, yeah yeah yeah. The, yeah there's the rounds as well of course yeah so they go from three minutes to five minutes um ultimately if you fight for titles in um at amateur and then go up to regular pros the fight time is the same yeah it's still fight time is the same it's just still 15 minutes but yeah you have more rest at, at the amateurs so rather than doing five threes you're now doing three fives um but that's like the minimum you're ever going to do as a pro is is three five. So that's like five minutes when you used to be an amateur. It's sort of five yeah. minutes round. Five minute rounds are a long time. Um, but one one thing I was going to say the uh, people might not appreciate is the the refs sort of mentality changes. And I got I got that a little bit from having like rules meetings and things where um, the refs will um, talk about how. In, in amateurs, they're looking to like protect you more. I mean, they're always looking to protect you, whether you're amateur or pro. But if um, the streams are a lot if, longer if you, in pro in terms yeah, of what they're yeah, allowed, yeah, to you go. have a lot more rope when you're when you're a pro. So there was a point um, at the end of the fight when I was locked in that triangle, where um, he was he was squeezing. It was hard to breathe, and I was pretty tired at that point, so it was very hard to breathe. And um, he was squeezing, but it wasn't quite coming on. I had a little bit of space. And then he sort of like opened his hips up and started like throwing, throwing hammer fists to me and uh, to my head. And um, he was throwing like a lot fast. And they were kind of like, 
a little bit pity party punches, not not really very well, damaging. Damage. No, yeah, like I could have could have hung out there a little bit longer. To be honest, I, I think at one point I just like put my arm out and it was completely blocking it because you can't really get around and you, you can't generate much leverage from that angle anyway yeah. when you're on, on your back and someone's in a triangle. Um, a pro, that'd be different because you can throw elbows, which are a lot more yeah. damaging, cause cuts. But the the referee um, started saying to me, started shouting at me, saying like, you've got to get out of there. You've got to get out of there. And that put a lot of urgency in me to, um, you know, I started like standing up on my feet and started trying to shake him off and things and like tied me out a little bit more. And then I went down and I was blocking and I tried to like turn, like throw some shots at him um, and then like tried to get up, shake him off again. And it was all because of that urgency that the referee was giving me to, to move because I thought he was going to stop it. Yeah. without me actually submitting he was going to stop it because i was because taking of these so many unanswered out. strikes that unanswered weren't damaging strikes. but they exactly, were unanswered yeah. yeah so i i knew and that was like a little bit of experience by me at, at play that, um the fact that like i knew that he might stop the fight there so i needed to to get up and move because a lot of people might have just like stayed there thinking like oh i'm fine and then the referee stops Ref it and then you're like oh why did you stop it i always hate that I hate that one. I mean, I know sometimes referees stop it when they shouldn't. But yeah. Like, the, you've, you've probably given the referee a reason. Yeah, you make an excellent point. That, that's, that's a really good point. The uh, the leeway in amateur is so much less. Yeah. Like I said, you, you're, not, you're not in there getting paid for it. You're not a professionally sanctioned fighter. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're going to be look, looking to protect you even more than they do at the pro level. And like I said, at the pro level, they're still obviously looking to protect you. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's something a lot of people don't appreciate. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> the way that that triangle felt, it was kind of just a little bit unfortunate because the side where you would want to walk your legs to, the cage the was cage on that was side, there. so it was in the way. I was thinking, you know, I've been obsessing so much <laughs> about like, oh, what should I have done? And I was thinking, you know, because I kind of stood up at one point to try and shake him off. I was thinking like, why didn't I sort of like stand up a bit more, like posture up a bit more, so he's like, his back's actually off the off the floor and then just swing him around to the other side yeah so that then his side that he wants to go to yeah, is against the yeah. cage and now he can't turn that corner and now i can turn that corner but like whatever it didn't happen <laughs> you know I mean? hindsight is a beautiful yeah. thing but, you know you, you have know. to make those decisions in milliseconds yeah and like if uh, if i get in that situation again maybe i'll have be cognizant enough yeah. to to think to do that so it's all part of the experience isn't it ultimately that's what amateurs for it's for experience yeah. nobody ever built a legendary career off being an amazing amateur yeah, I'm sure yeah. there's loads mm -hmm. of amazing amateur mma fighters and amateur boxers that like we've never heard of because they couldn't convert it when it came to the pros that's it that they you know went 10 and 0 as an amateur um, in, yeah. in mma and then you know they had a few pro fights and ended up two and three or something yeah, yeah. So, so the idea for me now is to um just like get back to training. I actually, uh, I sustained a little bit of an elbow injury during the fight because um, he took me down one time. I did what everybody knows that you shouldn't do. And I went and like planted my hand and hyperextended yeah. my elbow on the way down. So like that's a little bit sore at the moment. So that's why I haven't been, I haven't been at the gym um, recently. Well, it's only been a week, so recently. Yeah, so yeah. Been a, yeah. It feels but, a long time though, doesn't it? Oh, it's, yeah. Yeah. So like, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going out of my mind. Like, wow. Right. Yeah. Trained in ages. Yeah, like, it feels like I haven't trained. Days. Days. Yeah, I've been, I've been to, I've been to the gym, gym. You know, d just done like legs, done some squats and stuff like that. Can't do too much with this arm just yet. But um, you know, it was always going to be the way. After this fight, I was just going to like tone down the training massively, enjoy Christmas with the family, and then in the new year, start thinking about um, uh, getting back and and I want to um, start thinking about. Uh, just like adapting to the program and when we do like our squad sessions and stuff Jimmy pretty much always um, does stuff with, with thoughts to the program so we're always like drilling Drill uh, drilling elbows and stuff like that and um, five minute rounds not landing them we're not meant to <laughs> yeah just like just <laughs> pretending to throw them um, but yeah like think thinking about where the openings are for, for elbows here and things like that and knees to the head and all that kind of stuff um, and uh Jimmy's taken a shine into like leg locks recently, so he's been yeah. like, 
you know, he's been heel hooking he, people all over the yeah, place. Heel hooking, yeah, <laughs> mostly me. I think mean, <laughs> like sixty percent so, of the so heel this hooks is good. are on me. Is good. If, it if feels you win like that, his anyway. test me, then you'll be yeah, heel yeah. hook ready for for the pros. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's the idea. Just like get ready for the pro game, and then when um, something comes along, when it's like the right matchup, then uh, yeah, we'll we'll take that and go from there and. Uh, Make a bit of money, which yeah. would be nice. Yeah, little yeah, bit, little, bit of, you, little bit of pocket. Gotta forget on the side. that. Like, oh, hang on, I actually get paid for this when, yeah, I, get, yeah. when I go pro. Yeah. It's not yeah, just a, I mean, a new rule, rule set. I'm actually a professional athlete. Yeah. And the whole point of being a professional athlete is that you do get paid. Unfortunately, a lot of people, you know, don't get paid as much as I would say they should. They should, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you do get paid. Yeah, but, yeah. And I'm very fortunate that I'm, I'm not in a position where I need to rely on yes. fighting for, for a paycheck. You know, like I said, I'm a teacher. I've got a, a decent career. Um, I work part time to um, to support my family, and uh, so that can that can be there to support my family. Because um, like we could talk about my, my son as well, but he's got yeah. various like yeah, med- yeah. medical special needs and things like that. So um, that's that's a, a big concern and something that I always want to be uh, around for. But considering the perspective that what my wife went through as well, it's it's part of our lifestyle that we want to, um, you know, not live to work, work to live yeah. sort of thing and and make it so that we have time to, to do the things that we really love in life rather than living for the weekend like, like so many people do. Yeah. And I definitely want to get into that family values, um, all of that stuff, but just to kind of, kind of cap off the fighting, mm. um, line of questioning do you have kind of like ultimate goals in mma that you want to achieve uh before you kind of hang them up mm. or is it very much that like this you know this has kind of been the goal going pro i'm here now and i'm just going to take each fight at a time and as you said enjoy the process of it do it because i love doing it do, do you think about the goals much or is it really just enjoying the process and seeing where it goes yeah i think initially when i sort of got hooked on MMA on the, on the training and wanting to compete and thinking, you know, this is going to be a major aspect of my life. Um, you, you have, you know, you have your, your flights of fancy and uh, I've, I've heard you talk about it with, on podcasts with, with other people, you know, fighters, they have to have this like sort of delusion about them a little bit where they think that they're, they're the, you know, they're, God's gift to the sport, I think the best thing since sliced You have bread. to have outrageous ambition. To, to, to be, you know, in any way moderately successful in something like yeah. MMA, you have to. You have to be outrageously ambitious. You have to, it's like that old saying, I think I said it with mystery, you shoot for the stars, you might land on the moon. Mm. I, I, maybe some people are different, but I just think if you're going to go into a sport as intense as this, you've got to be shooting really high because... If you're not, if you've kind of not shooting that high, you're doing it halfway. And if you do this halfway, you're going to get hurt and it's not going to go well. Yeah, I think I think there's something to be said for being quite rational about it, though. Yeah, yeah, think, yeah. I, think, I, think, I, think it, I think you definitely have to start at that place of delusion, like you said. Yeah. And obviously, then once you become more experienced, you can have then your, you can, yeah. you you can know, have your flights of fancy. You can think like, oh, how amazing is it going to be when I'm in the UFC and, and lifting that world title and all that kind of stuff. And everyone who's ever wanted to compete in MMA has, has thought of that. Um, but uh, I think, yeah, you got to consider, you know, I'm, I'm 32 as well. I didn't start competing until I was like well into my 20s. Uh, where oftentimes, especially now in the UFC, you know, they've got like teenagers in, in there now, yeah, like yeah, yeah. At, the, at the pinnacle of the sport, where you know, you've got to imagine that must mean that they moved training like since they were 10 or before 10 or something like that. It's crazy to think about. So I'm under no delusion that I'm going to reach that sort of level. Um, so some people would say, like I've, I've heard, um, like on uh, other podcasts, like like Rogan and stuff like that. He's talked about before how, like you know, if you're going to do MMA, you have to be like all in, nothing else about it. Otherwise, you're just going to come against someone who is all in, and then you're going to get fucked up. And 
like yeah kind of but like that sort of i mean it doesn't really touch with reality a little bit for me because like i still want to do it i still want to compete like you're saying like i shouldn't be allowed yeah, there, there is a bit of I sh- I sh- some people yeah i shouldn't be allowed just because i don't like give up my job sort of irresponsibly and and like not consider my family and my like my time management and things like that and and just try and be like purely just a, a professional athlete and 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 work to it a hundred percent just on that everything that i do is to do with that because i don't think uh <laughs> I, I, I won't be making any money and uh, i probably wouldn't have like a marriage <laughs> after yeah. doing that for too long do you know what i mean so it's and that's not to say that daniela isn't amazingly supportive with, with all this stuff because when we're doing the amateurs you know i'm not i'm not getting paid for any of it so everything that i'm doing like i'm paying for it costs us money yeah. to, to go and compete and that's not even talking about the amount of time that it takes to to do all these things like on the like weight cut week it's such a faff it's such a faff because like i'm like i usually like uh prep the meals in in the house and like i'm not making food the same and i'm not eating at the same times i'm barely eating as it is you know i'm going to the toilet every five minutes because i'm drinking nine liters yeah. of water a yeah day. yeah it is little and then like and then i've got to go to to birmingham to gtfp on friday for the weigh-ins and then again on saturday for the fight and i come back late and she's looking after my son the, the whole time on her own um so it, like it's it's a very it is a very selfish pursuit um, I think Joe talked about that. Like he's, he's yeah, talking about is, he's being saying, an athlete yeah. is selfish, and being a coach is is selfless. Yeah, and it's so true. Being trying to do a, an athletic pursuit, it's like it's such a a selfish thing, and um, yeah, oftentimes it does make you think about like whether whether it's worth it. You know, I've had conversations um, with like a few of the guys that we know from the gym here. I had like a. A long deep conversation about it with uh, Kieran, you know, before he went yeah. down south. So, um, and I was just like, yeah, like, and it's it's not just that superficial sort of like, oh, why do we do this? You know, we come yeah. out of a, a training session all sore, and we're like, why do we do this to ourselves? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, oh, that's, I'm done. I'm done. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm done. I'm never doing this again. Yeah, never do it. Never again. It's like after a night out, you're like, yeah, yeah, never yeah. drinking yeah. again. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah we're just like in the post training hangover basically we're like never going to do it again but like like seriously like what what is it that makes me do it and i always just come back to like sort of the counterfactual of like like i can't do without it yeah it's just for me the pure love for me personally yeah and i can justify it as many ways as i want i could talk about like the you know the human tradition of combat and like being a being a man and the um, you know, t- somewhat egotistical thing about like wanting to be that guy wanting to be as the well. Alpha. Yeah, want- not necessarily alpha. So I mean, I'm never going to alpha Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? A lot of guys in the or gym, a, an alpha. alpha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, be, yeah, want, yeah. Just wanting to be that guy that, that people look at and be like, oh yeah, he's he's a pro fighter. You know, that guy's he's strong. If it, yeah, if I was like. Um, back being a, a teenager at school or something, I'd, I'd probably think something like, you know, I want to, I want to be hard. I want people to think that I'm hard. Yeah, yeah. You know, every every, every lad, I think everyone lad, lad does. And yeah. like you said, there's obviously you know anthrop- anthropological reasons for that, yeah. and where that comes from. But at the end of the day, what it translates to into real life is you love fighting. Yeah, you just love fighting. Yeah, I love it. I love, I love the the, the technical aspect of it. I love learning it. Um, I love being able to like perform things that I've learned on a, on like a sort of <laughs> an unsuspecting victim, if you will, do you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. On, you know, they, yeah, they, yeah. They, they know that you're going to do something. They don't know what it is. And you, you hit something that's straight out of the, the training room. And it's just like, Oh, that is just, that is just yeah. bliss. When you hit that, like that lovely takedown or, or that nice sub or whatever it is. Um, yeah. It, it's just, yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's like, the height of that sort of um, that flow state, isn't it? When you mm. when you can when you can reach that. So yeah, it's kind it of just, an intersection between science and art, isn't it? Yeah, people it, say that is it an art? Is it a science? Well, it's both. Yeah, and there's just, gratification it, in both of those elements. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's it's an art, it's a science, and it's just it's it's at that 
um, when when you're right in that spot between um, it being uh, monotonous because you've drilled it so many times and so much of a challenge because it's uh, it, it's it's like a almost seems like an insurmountable challenge because it's so complex. It's like when you hit that right that right that middle spot and you're in that flow state, it's just so fulfilling. And I think martial arts just gives you that in abundance. And then you know you've got the, all the other stuff about that that make it good as a development tool for for kids as well. Um, you know, teaching them like discipline and and uh, hard work and all that kind of stuff. It's just yeah, for, for me, for me, and it's not not for everyone, but for me, it's perfect, and I can't do without it. And uh, I don't know how much I would get out of it if I couldn't also compete in it and you know try and apply it in in a real situation. So the the uh, the competitive element, the act of actually not just training but going out and competing is very important to you. Yeah, yeah, very important because. It sounds trite to say, like, because then you can see that it works, but it's it's kind of that. Um, well, it is. It's putting it to the test, isn't it? Yeah, like yeah. you said, it's yeah, it's, testing it's running skills. the experiment. Yeah. yeah, yeah, testing skills. Yeah, I don't think I've like fully fleshed out my thoughts on it even even yet. Even though I've I've thought about it quite a lot of like, I'm like what what is it? Why is it that that I do this? You know, being in the the position and life that I am like what makes me want to commit so much of my time and energy towards this this thing yeah I don't know if I've quite got my my head around it yet but that's yeah that's that's as good as I've got at the moment you know I mean? this is my first mince pie of, uh, of the year of Christmas you've not done yet no no I haven't no um after I don't obviously I don't cut as much weight as you do for a fight like I do cut weight for uh for my comps yeah um so like I'd had it's the last one that you did ADCC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had to monitor my weight quite a bit for like the past three months. Mm. So sometimes I was just going to go mental in December, but then when it comes, it, to, it you, comes don't, you, don't, yeah. you don't want to. I know, right? It's to. weird, isn't Which it? Because then when you when you're actually in it, especially like the week of and like you're cutting carbs and everything, oh my god, you just imagine yeah. everything that you, you want have like to a eat. list. You have a never ending list in your head of all the things that you're going to gorge yourself on once you're done, and then the time comes and you're just like. What I can have it now? I can have, uh, uh, like I think and your stomach shrunk as well. Yeah, so yeah. You can't eat everything. That, I think the most you know what I mean. You could before. The most outrageous thing that I've had was I had um, you know Papa John's do a, an XXL pizza. I had that, and that stretch that definitely stretched my stomach out. <laughs> that was a lot of food. Um, I've had like a couple of beers. We went to a, a, a friend's fortieth birthday party last night so i'd like i had a drink or two i mean i was driving so i only had like two drinks um throughout like the whole night and then yeah i've been like snaffling a bunch of those <laughs> they're nice and then it's it's more like just little things when you're just like feeling a bit peckish throughout the day it's mm. like oh yeah i can just grab a few crisps i can just grab like a bit of chocolate or something like that but that's what that's what fills in those ab spaces <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. Oh, they're, they're really good. Yeah, I mean, that's, nice, that's, that's 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 my that's definitely starts my mince pie train. Now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Top tip: get some, um, get a little pot of clotted cream. Mm. Pot of clotted cream. Put those in the microwave, and then clotted cream on top. Have oh, that's bag. a brilliant idea. That's bougie, mate. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna give that a go. Mate. Yeah, you get fat as fuck. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Come back at heavyweight yeah. next year. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so the white the mince pie crumbs off your notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I get it. I'll, I'll, for the rest of this episode, people are just going to be hearing me going, <laughs> like getting all out of my teeth. So, are you familiar with stoicism? I am. Yes. Yeah. So, for anyone, I mean, it's quite popular now at this point. Yeah. But for anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about, stoicism is a philosophy that was founded in ancient Greece, developed in ancient Rome. And um, the the principles of the philosophy, um, well, you, you tell me what your, your kind of definition of it is, but to me, it, it's uh, the art or the practice of being immune to the circumstances around you and being able to maintain a stillness, a peace, and still carry out the actions you need to, regardless of those external circumstances, mm. and ultimately have a, 
a stoicness about you throughout whatever you face. The reason I bring it up is because I kind of, in my mind, I will sometimes label or often label people as, yeah, they're a modern day stoic. They're a modern day stoic. People that I see that I think embody those uh, stoic qualities. Mm. And you, Chris Radcliffe, are one of those people that I look at. And, I and, I, and I, I do say to myself, yeah, Chris, Chris is a stoic. Uh, and I do generally mean that because I think you have such a, a calm and steady energy about you. Well, a, a few reasons. Number one, in your fights, lots of your fights have been incredibly violent. We talk about how in amateur the the leeway that refs give is is much less. Mm. Your some of your amateur fights have been the most violent amateur fights that I've I've seen. Yeah. Um. And you you've shown complete fearlessness, fearlessness,ness. Um. Throughout all of those, and then in the gym, like I said, you're always in the gym. You're such a hard worker. And you always steady. Some people you'll see them down after training, or you'll see them elevated when they've had a really good training session with you. Like you always just seem very steady on an even keel. Yeah. And then as well, mix that with the fact all the things we've already talked about, and which we'll go on to talk about with your son, the things that you've had to face in life. You've obviously dealt with those very well too. So I basically just want to ask you inside the interior, what's it like? Because obviously. The whole purpose of being stoic is on the outside, you seem to deal with it incredibly well, regardless of how you feel on the inside. But talk to me about that. Talk to me about whether that's something that's kind of been always been a natural personality trait of yours or whether it's something you've actively and consciously cultivated. Yeah. Um, it's all a facade. It's really batshit. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's hanging on by a thread. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally, fingernails. Yeah. No, uh, yeah. I appreciate that. That's yeah, really kind of you to say. I think, um, yeah, like I'm familiar. I'm not a uh, massive student of of stoicism, but um, I'm I'm aware of um, you know quite a lot of the sort of like modern day interpretations. You know, from hearing things as as I said to you before, I'm a massive fan of like podcasts and and things like that. So it, it comes up, up a lot in uh, sort of like modern day. Pop psychology, pop philosophy. Well, that's it. It's kind of, of like stuff. the flavor of the, I say the week, it's really kind of been like the flavor of the decade. Yeah, in terms yeah. Of philosophy. Definitely, yeah. And, and yeah, I like uh, your, your definition there. It's really all about not letting um, outside influences um, sort of affect you, like, yeah, perturb your, your steady state of mind too much because ultimately that stuff you can't control. It's just taking control of what you can. And what you can't, don't worry about it. Really, you know, just just take, just do what you can. Um, so I think my my mantra through life, I think, um, and it all comes from, as, as you said, some of like the the difficult circumstances that that have happened in my in my adult life. Um, not not so much in my childhood. I had a very sort of like peaceful, easygoing childhood, like very nice, like very nice family. Um, and uh, I was happy. Uh, so I didn't go through too much. Maybe that, you know, if we're going to psychologize it, maybe that like adds to it because I don't have much in the way of like childhood trauma or anything like that. I don't think. Um, but, uh, my, my mantra I think is uh, perspective. So you can always have perspective on on what it is that you're doing and what it ultimately compares to that's actually real stuff so you know my wife getting cancer when i was 22 and she was 29 like and the treatment that she had to go through that was real and that that sucks um the one thing that i haven't mentioned that's uh, probably the biggest part of it as well is like once you're done with treatment and you get the the all clear, there isn't really an all clear. Yeah, you're in remission. Yeah, um, and you can stop being in remission very very quickly. Uh, and it's a, it's a spectre that sort of hangs over your head. Uh, ultimately, for for the rest of your life, you know she's coming up on ten years being in remission, which as time goes on further and further like that. That spectre sort of gets a little bit smaller, you know. It, the 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 panic sort of 
Um, I don't know if anybody, well, I'm sure many people listening will will come across it before, but when something like that happens, uh, it can bring on like very sudden, like sort of anxiety and, and panic and things like that. And just like sudden cases of worry and they can be uh, sort of spaced out, they come and go. And I think as time goes on, especially when you get sort of 10 years in, the, the ebb and flow of it happens over a longer period of time and um she's just start, sort of started getting to the point now where she can think about the future in in a really tangible and serious way um so that's real um this all the stuff to do with my my son so um my son was um, diagnosed while he was still in the, the womb with something called hydrocephalus, which is a uh, brain condition. It's, it's actually the most common like, reason that children have brain surgery is hydrocephalus. So we all have, um, in our brains, we have uh, fluid, what are called ventricles in our, in our brain, and they send cerebrospinal fluid up and down our spine in sort of like a a water feature like cycle and um, in uh, Rocco's brain the sort of the the filtering out of the brain part is uh, malformed such that the fluid builds up in the brain but it doesn't it doesn't leave so it doesn't drain, it doesn't drain out so um, what that meant was while he was in the womb he had uh, we had the MRI scans done and things like that uh, while he was still in there and um, there was a point where his, his brain was essentially just um, the, the brain stem um, a very thin sort of I describe it as like a like an eggshell of like two of the two like sort of hemispheres of the brain very thin eggshell of brain matter and then in the middle it was all just fluid um, his, his for context his, his ventricles were uh, went up to like 50 millimeters which is extremely severe. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that you know that was real. We didn't even realize at the time exactly how real it was until you know we were sat down by the doctors when it was getting close to the time for him to be delivered and things. And um, he ended up being delivered five weeks early because the the, the skull was getting too large. Um, she wasn't able to deliver him naturally she had to have a extended cesarean um so a cesarean scar actually like sort of goes further across than than what would normally happen um and uh before that we were sort of like called into a, a meeting at a hospital with his with his care team and um basically asked if um he were to be born and not able to support his own life, whether we would want to intervene in, in any way. Um, and like, to what extent would we want to intervene? And, uh, I think sort of in the, in the pressure of the moment, we sort of went with, um, let, let nature take its course sort of thing. So, um, is, so is, is school was growing. It, it, she was having scans and, and it was getting measured uh, like very often at that point. And uh, there was no um, NICU beds at, at the time as well. So it got to the point where it was just like, we need to get him out, NICU bed or not, uh, and sort of see what happens. So he was delivered. And um, when he was delivered, there was sort of a very... Uh, tense moment of silence after he was out and then we heard him crying and so that means that he's breathing because he was crying and the uh the the surgeon he sort of like popped his head over the the, the sheet thing the divider and he was like like yeah he's he's here he's you know he's he's awake he's fine um and he was like taken away to be be cleaned up and stuff and uh you know, we we got to we got to hold him, and we were in in hindsight now we sort of won because a few a few things happened um, in the lead up to uh, 
well o- over the course that we were in hospital we were in we were in we stayed in the hospital with him for uh like a week i think and over that course in hindsight like certain things happened that made us think that perhaps they were just like waiting to see if he was just gonna like pass pass away naturally um you know we had doctors coming to us that we'd like never seen before obviously didn't know us didn't know our, our case didn't know that um like that we'd been told this all before sort of thing but they were like oh you know if the if things go badly then we can take you to a private room and you can say goodbye to him and stuff like that and this is like while i'm holding him yeah and he's like like he's he's here he's, he's yeah, fine yeah. do you know what i mean and he wasn't he wasn't fine but you know he, he was clearly you could you could see it like the the head um his his head was was massive it was, sort of similar size to, to what it is now and he's five years old um and it, and it grew even larger than that afterwards before he had uh, a shunt put in which sort of like is an artificial drain that sort of like okay yeah i was going to ask how yeah. what kind of medical inspection. yeah so it's like a so a shunt is it's, it's effectively like a it's like a straw really that, that, that attaches to the outside of the skull and uh, they actually bore a hole in your skull for it and it and it goes like to the middle of his head sort of thing and uh there's a tube that runs underneath his skin you can like you can feel it it runs behind his ear down his neck and goes into his body cavity where the fluid is sort of like reabsorbed in, into his body okay, okay so it's all internal yeah everything's yeah. internal yeah it's all quite a, you know it's quite a, it's quite sophisticated but it's also um quite an old technology we've met people that are sort of in their 60s that had this done when they were children wow. yeah which is really surprising as I said, it's you know it's one of the most common thing that children have uh, brain surgery for. So you know it's been around for quite a while. Um, and uh, the thing with these shunts is they're very liable to um, fail or become infected at the, at the surgery site, which his first one did, which meant back in hospital on like antibiotics and things had an external shunt fitted while the, the, while he was having antibiotics which was like an absolute nightmare i mean living in the hospital is is a nightmare as it is um you know <laughs> that's that's a whole different conversation that we could have like the the way that like patients are have to live in in hospital it's so not conducive to recovery yeah in terms of, yeah, the, amount of the amount of sleep that they get and just like the way that the environment's set up and I know, like, I love the NHS. I love the people that work in the NHS. And they all work incredibly hard and do really good work. But, um, you know, even on their side of things, like, it's not a conducive working environment when you have ner- nurses and surgeons that are, you know, doing complex procedures on, like, two hours sleep for three days or something like that. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah, I, I always think, like, if an alien came from another planet and you took them into a hospital on Earth yeah. and you told them this is a place where people go to get well, they'd, yeah. they might <laughs> or, laugh. Or you ask them, what's this place for? On. It's like, oh, this is to get rid of your sick people. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's just to illustrate the point that... I don't know exactly what you're saying. I think everyone's grateful for the NHS, of course, but um, we can still acknowledge that there are lots of improvements that need to be made. And mm. I think that's the main one. You, you go into a hospital and you think this, like you said, isn't an environment that's conducive to people's recovery. Yeah. And I say that as, you know, a parent that spent, you know, cumulatively weeks in the hospital with, with my son and like it, it takes it out of me. You know, and I'm like a young athletic man and I can like get up and walk around and do whatever I need to do to make myself feel better. I could, you know, go out and get whatever food I wanted, but you, it just like grinds down it's on the you. environment, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's the, it's like the, the schedule of the day. It's like the pacing of everything that happens. It's having, they have to have observations all through the nights, which wakes you up and, yeah, it's just an absolute nightmare. It's not conducive to health. It's not conducive to recovery. And it's something that I think really needs to get sorted out. But back to the original point about stoicism and everything, all that stuff that I just mentioned gives you massive perspective when you're um, you know, doing yourself down because 
you know, you got hit a couple of times in sparring or something like that, or even take it to its uh, extreme, like last week where I lose a fight that I was winning and I had to actually tap out. So first thing, first time I've ever been finished in a in my amateur fights, I lost three times before then. They were all decisions, and you know that 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 part of it almost it doesn't you know for a moment it bothered me, but it doesn't really bother me that much. Like the loss bothers me more than than how I lost. But um, like ultimately, th- the perspective is that I'm not. It's not a life or death thing. I think about uh, sort of like a ancient analog to what we're doing i'm not picking up a piece of metal in the coliseum and trying to hack someone to pieces that's trying to hack me to yeah. pieces yeah. You know what i mean it's not it's not that as much as the day, it's a sim not it's not a simulated fight but it's um a simulated fight to the death yeah you, you know what i mean extremely like, extremely it's bit, simulated it's, it's yeah. very rare that somebody actually dies yeah. in, a, in a mixed martial arts contest yeah and when they die it's not because of the oftentimes it's not yes. because of the damage that they sustain in the fight yeah. it's because of maybe they had a, a, a previous medical condition or something to do with the external or something circumstances like that. yeah 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 and as much as a lot of fighters love to think that they're a modern day gladiator and like it's it's not that it, it's not that serious, bro. Like, yeah. Seriously, you 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 get in in your pants and you you're like a piece of a entertaining night out for most people. Do you know what I mean? And like, I mean, even you could say even the gladiators were that, but like, like what you're doing, you're gonna you might get hurt or you might have an amazing win or whatever. But ultimately, you're gonna walk away from that, and your life isn't gonna be that massively changed thankfully it isn't a fatal affair 99.9 percent of yeah. the time yeah. where yeah, it's yeah. a fight on a battlefield in medieval times or a gladiator contest in, yeah. in ancient rome <laughs> it was a fatal affair 100 percent of, of those battles ended in someone dying yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and it's even like um you know i think about it because you, you can get caught up in your own um delusions of grandeur mm. oh yeah these things that i'm doing you know competing doing all these challenges and stuff yeah you start to think, yeah, like I'm a gladiator, I'm a savage, all of these yeah. things. Then yeah. you're reminded of the fact that there's so many wars going on in this world. Exactly. And there's so many people fighting in those wars and they're the real savages. You know what I mean? Not to, not to say that you need to go out and fight a war in order to be a, a savage, but it just goes back to what you were saying, putting it in perspective that, yeah, it's good that you're challenging yourself and you're doing hard things. And of course, there, are, there, are, there can be horrible consequences uh, when things go wrong. Mm. However... You've got to keep that perspective that there are real life and death situations going on in this world that you may have to face at some point in your life, and that's obviously going to be very different to yeah. what you're doing on a day to day basis. No matter how hard what you're doing on a day to day basis is. Yeah, there was an, another. Um, I was going to be on some couple of years ago. I was invited to be on a on another podcast, and it didn't end up panning out. But they sent me some questions beforehand, and um, they asked how martial arts, doing martial arts sort of um, uh, helps me deal with like the difficult scenarios in, in my life. And I was like, it doesn't, it's the other way around. Mm-hmm. Like the, 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 hard, the hard situation, the, the hard life situations, they're the real things. And they give you the perspective to be able to go into something like an MMA fight and know that ultimately it's in the grand scheme of, th- in the grand scheme of things, it's nothing. You know what I mean? Like, Whenever I go into, whenever I'm about to fight, um, if I feel like I'm getting too in my head about it and it's becoming too much like, oh, it's this, it's this big, it's this big thing, um, I just think like, what you know, I can come home the next day having won, or come home having lost, and my son is going to like treat me exactly the same way, my family ultimately are going to treat me exactly the same way several years from now it's not going to have like shifted the course of my life very much at all um you know that's to say unless you're a you're a top prize fighter and uh, you know if you're fighting in like pfl tournament or something like that and you win that fight and you get a million dollars and if you don't you don't then yeah that's that's something different that's like you know that's a major life changing thing um but you know for, for the scenario that I'm talking about where we're just 
we're just amateur fighters, you know, whether we're fighting at the, the top level for a belt or it's like an amateur debut, these things don't, they don't matter. Even like the lower level pros, like it's good to keep your perspective about it. It's, you know, it's slightly more dangerous, but ultimately it, it doesn't really matter in the, in the grand course of your, of your life. So that's, that's, that's my mantra, sort of a <laughs> long-winded answer. But <laughs> yeah, my mantra is you got to keep perspective with these things and uh, not, not take yourself too seriously as well. You know, coming back to the um, stoicism thing, I think that's a big part of it. You know, like you were saying, you can, you can, do, um, you can do all like different fitness challenges or you can, you can fight and things like that. And you think like, oh yeah, I'm... I'm uh, like I'm tapping into something, like I'm I'm really like becoming something special by doing this. It's like don't take yourself too seriously. Like, you know, you just you just run in. You're just getting in a you're just getting in a you're basically just having a spa, but it's like a little bit ramped up intensity and a few people are watching. It's it's not all that. You know what I mean? And then even when you translate it to the pros and to the UFC and stuff like that, like yeah the amount of people watching is now in the thousands or tens of thousands or whatever. And there's money on the line, but ultimately, you know, you're just getting in there and you're testing your skills against someone who's supposedly of equal, you know, equal ability to you. And like, that's what it is. It's not, it's not like I'm a gladiator warrior. Uh, I'm going to be like the best there ever was, you know, all, all that kind of stuff is bullshit. So you strip it down to the fundamental actions at the end of the day, take away, um, because it does become more than the sum of its parts, doesn't it? Yeah. Like you said, you throw the crowd in there, you throw the bright lights, you throw the bright lights, the camera, the fact that X amount of money's on the line, and then all of a sudden it's this massive thing. Mm. Would you say that's uh, kind of a... A psychological tool you you use strip things down to what, what I'm actually doing here. Do you think yeah, that, yeah, that definitely. process occurs? Yeah, yeah. Just strip it down. Yeah, just make it make it simple and kind of just just rationalize it. You know, what is it that, that I'm actually doing, and and what part of it is the part that I can control? Going back to stoicism as well, you can't control you know the fact that there's a crowd watching what they're gonna think of it you can just control what you can do in there at that moment um, and any thought of all that external stuff is just distracting you from what you need to be thinking about doing in that moment so you said training martial arts fighting that doesn't prepare you or, or didn't prepare you for the um, incredibly real scenarios that you had to, to face with your partner and with your son so in those moments what what did keep you going what did keep you stronger was it just the necessity of the circumstance the necessity that you had to stay strong what's the alternative was there anything conscious that you were aware of that kept you going other than like i said the, the fact that you just thought well i have to because what was the alternative was there was there any kind of hmm. what was the inner dialogue i guess what was the inner dialogue is the question i'm asking yeah, I think um, I think there's a lot to be said for sort of that. What's the alternative? Um, you know, I was never going to. Uh, I was never going to run out on on uh, my my wife while she was going through cancer treatment. I was never going to. You know, like what? Think about what does what does not dealing with it look like. Not not dealing with it means like totally either like neglecting her or or leaving her in that situation. The situation with my son means like totally neglecting her and him and not being around for that situation. It's like it's kind of clear what sort of person you are if you if you do that. Um, there's nothing. There's there's nothing like attractive about that scenario yeah, there's whatsoever. no negotiation going on there's yeah. no thought of yeah. oh there is an alternative it's like no yeah no. I, we know what the alternative is and that was never going to be an no, option for you never and um i think yeah i think the difference is made in in 
it's not necessarily whether you like whether you stay there and deal with it because the vast vast majority of people will it's like how you how you approach it um so a lot of people don't do the like, kind of like the ultimate option of walking out running away but yeah. they kind of do an equivalent of that where like i said they shut down and they're not really there mm. for the people that that need uh that need them yeah so it's i guess it's not falling into that middle ground where mm. you're you're still there physically but you're not there mentally yeah and you, yeah you, you, yeah you can like you can still be there but you can sort of check out um and uh like i don't know if uh i could you know i can't sort of mark my own homework and say that like i dealt with it uh, amazingly um compared to anyone else but i think the main things that i've thought of during those times when it was when it was happening was uh, and maybe this does come from martial arts a little bit is just like trying to be like trying to be strong trying to be the trying to be the the man so to speak like trying um yeah trying to be strong and also the facts that like with these things like these things weren't they weren't happening to me they were happening to someone else do you know what i mean so i was just and, and you know you can say something's happening to the child it's it's happening to you as well but like i wasn't i wasn't carrying him i always i almost kind of took myself out of it in a way and and just thought of it as like not happening to me so one of the things um you know um this is going to be uh, a divider for the audience maybe but you know jordan peterson yeah i know it's like it can be controversial yeah, yeah. Like pretty, awesome. divisive yeah pretty divisive yeah pretty divisive but um i think where he where he thrives is when he's talking about when he's on his turf which is when he's talking about psychology and things like that and um like and human development i think he's he's pretty good on that and uh, one of the things that uh he said or sort of one of the things that i think he asked a uh, like a former therapy client of his to to think about is when um someone dies in in your family uh and it like it, at the funeral like what person do you want to be at the funeral do you want to be the person like sobbing by the casket or do you want to be the person like offering the tissue or do you want to be the person that's like helping out do you want to make yourself useful and i feel like um i mean this was before i even knew about jordan peterson but i, th- I think um somewhere along the way maybe the way i was i was raised or brought up or something had that that sense of like when when something bad is happening it can be happening to to you and those around you you can kind of make it like it's it's not happening to you it's happening to them and helping them through it and <clears throat> that in turn helps you through it at the same time because being being supportive and being shoulder to cry on that that helps you through it as well and that's not to say you know like suck it all up and don't be vulnerable you know there were definitely points during um, both of those times with my wife and my son when I was vulnerable as well and you know I needed to to talk about it and get it out of people but um, ultimately being of service and thinking that uh, it's not happening to me how, how can I help the people that it's happening to I think that that was sort of like my my guiding principle so to speak and helps me help me deal with it What's life like for Rocco now? You said he's five years old now, or almost yeah, five. He's five. So he's yeah. at he's at um, special school here in Loughborough, which he absolutely loves. They're amazing there. Um, it it was a a long old battle to to get him in there because the um, EHCP process, educational uh, health and care plan, um, is it's uh, quite a a fraught system there's the you know there's lots of things that that you have to do and lots of um children that need additional support don't get it uh and, you know the system is such that like you know me and me and my wife two university educated people um like really struggled with the 
amount of like evidence that you need to collect and 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 send in and like the way that you need to write things and fortunately we were able to get to the end of it but i can only imagine you know there's so many people in this country that that don't have the sort of like educational background like privilege really that we've had and they still have to do all this for for their for their children that might have like way worse more complex needs than than rocco has and so it's not necessarily the most accessible no no it's not it's extremely difficult and um it's the basis for a lot of um you know there's a lot of sort of like protest movements happening at the moment with um sen special educational need um parents you know trying to uh, trying to get the support they need and make the the system more accessible um but you know we were lucky to lucky enough to get uh the support that that rocco needs and um he's you know he's thriving it's problem is the human brain is maybe the most complex thing in the universe right so yeah you know it, it we're not even close to knowing how all the various parts of it interact um and we may never get there because you know every brain is different wired up differently but um you know ho- hopefully and uh, like we are advancing in that area uh, so th- but as of right now there's there's not really any telling of where his developmental ceiling is going to be as it stands right now he's he's developmentally delayed uh he's diagnosed autistic um he uh has um epilepsy which he takes medication for um so there's a lot of sort of like downstream effects that have happened from this this brain condition that he has um for a while although it's getting better he had uh, something called hemiplegia, which is uh, weakness down one side. So, he's, so he's, he used to, when he was first learning how to walk, which was quite late, um, he'd, used, he'd like drag his right foot and things and uh, preferentially use his left hand. I don't, think, I don't think anyone in either of our families is, is left-handed. You know, not to say that that's definitely not like he might just be left-handed anyway, but the fact that his right side has always been weaker and he will sort of like when he draws and writes and things like that, he'll like he'll pass the pen between his two hands and and do it whichever way. But uh, he always like preferentially before used his his left hand because his right side was weaker. So don't know how that's going to affect him in terms of you know, like writing and writing and things. But he's you know he's he's getting there. He's probably about the developmental age of um, perhaps like a three year old. Or something which you know i understand to people that don't have kids that might Doesn't might seem like much. Might, mean, yeah, yeah. might mean nothing but um when when you spend time around uh kids that sort of age th- there's a lot that goes on in in that period and if you see him with um children in his peer group you can see um you can see the differences quite quite starkly and how he uh process his language um just like his, his general understanding uh you know very repetitive very like you know he has like his little obsessions and things like that like right now he's really into like drawing dragons and dinosaurs and things and you know we've got like papers colored papers all over our house and like millions of drawings of dinosaurs and uh, really into um, number blocks which is a cbb show which is basically like all the characters are like you know the the little blocks that you had in maths that you like stick together, the, 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 the little those. blocks that you like clip together. Um, uh, I, I was never very good at maths, yeah, so bit, I probably pushed that yeah, to my mind. But yeah, basically, <laughs> basically, yeah, like the all the characters are like numbers basically, mm. and like you know, there's one. It's just a little cube. There's one and t- like two cubes is two, and he's orange, and they're all different colors and stuff, and they're all different characters it's really good at teaching kids maths actually and like he's a he's proper obsession with it at the moment because it's like probably 50 60 percent of what he says through the day is you know something like uh eight plus eight is 16 or, you know he's just saying like arithmetic all the time yeah yeah, yeah he loves That's it cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah 
So yeah, I don't know whether that's going to wear off or whether he's going to become some kind of math genius. Math genius. But yeah. yeah, who knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. I mean, uh, shows how naive I am about children and ages. But that's 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 good for someone that's five years old, right? Yeah, I mean, five year olds it, usually do arithmetic like that. He's doing it by rote. He's yeah. not. He's not calculating. Um, but ultimately, I think that's how we start. Doing, yeah. doing it um so he does he does it more but i think if you've got a five-year-old to try and do what he's doing i don't think it'd take much time for them to be able to do it it's just that he's his mind is quite set on doing that mm. at the moment he's very um, interested in that yeah thing. autistic people d- generally tend to find um things like uh numbers autistic children find like numbers and uh, letters very um Soothing, soothing yeah. because it's it's limited and you always sort of know what the answer is going to be. It, it's very logical. Um, the issue that they have is with like processing all the external stimuli of the world and, and making sense of it, especially when it comes to like you know social and personal things. So um, yeah, num- numbers are like a nice a nice escape for them in that way. So like yeah, he's ultimately he's he's doing as good as we could have ever hoped when he was born. I'm so, so happy, so, so proud of him. And like, I can't wait to see, you know, the person that, that he becomes. Um, and this is another uh, perspective thing, I think, because when we go out and we see parents of um, uh, typical, neurotypical children, we notice that like, a lot, a lot of the time, they're, like, they're not necessarily very nice to them. Mm. And I think a lot of it, it becomes, there's, a, there's an expectation that a lot of parents have sort of inbuilt. Um, and this is something that uh, you have to get over as a, more so as a, a dad, I think maybe, because I think fathers tend to have this idea of like, they're going to have a child and it's going to become this great person. And they have this like, ambition that's sort of like passed over from them to their child um and as soon as he um you know was found to have this this condition that he has you sort of have to let that go and um it can almost be like a bit of a like a like a grieving period like you're letting go a, a future person that's like not going to exist or something like that but what you you know but what you get in return when you you have your child it's like you wouldn't have them any other way yeah and every achievement, every developmental milestone that he hits is like cause for celebration. And any time he's not the way that most perhaps typical children would um, say that their children should be when he's not when he's not like acting in that way, and it might seem like it's like it's naughty or. Um, you know, it's frustrating because you don't understand things the, the same way. It's, you know, you get, going through what we've gone through with him, it just makes you a lot more understanding and patient. And uh, I think a lot of uh, parents of typical children could sort of learn learn a bit mm-hmm. from that because I think they, they put that, that baggage on their children, that expectation that they're going to be this great person right from the off and when they're not acting like they're sort of becoming that it sort of breeds resentment and and um you, you see it you see it come out and, yeah. you know not to say that like you know there aren't like great parents of typical children of course there are uh but like you know it's they're i, th- I think attached it's, to their expectations because yeah. they ha- they're in the fortunate position where they can have certain expectations yeah. whereas in a situation such as yourself I said you've been forced to kind of wipe some expectations off the table. Yeah, yeah, or, or yeah, it's it's the expectations that are gone. The the um, like the hope for the future and the desire to, um, you know, like form him, uh, for lack of a better term, um, into a into a like good fantastic person that that's still there yeah but yeah, like the, course, ex, yeah. the expectation that that he should be a certain way and like should should be acting like this and should be able to do this 
by this, oh, by this time this or by this age. Achieve by this age. Specific thing. Yeah. 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 That that goes. Yeah. But when that expectation goes, that's that just leaves open the like the joy of when he, he does things because whenever he does something new, it's like you don't expect it. So yeah, yeah it's it's a nice surprise every time. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a great point that um that you raised, yeah. Uh, we should uh, we should be grateful uh for what we have and I think when you're in a, a fortunate position that a fortunate position that's also a typical position, mm. it's easy to lose the gratitude for the fact that it is still a fortunate position even if, you know, even though even though it is the norm yeah. for most people, yeah, it, uh, you're still incredibly fortunate to be in that position. Yeah, and I understand because it is very hard to. It must be very hard for a, a parent of a typical child to get their head around what it must be like for for a parent of a of a non typical child because that's not the reality that they live. They only know what it's like with with their child. But um, yeah, I think. If uh, I don't know, if they like sort of spend a bit more time with like SAN children or with with their parents and stuff like that, give them that perspective again. You know, I always come back to that, and um, yeah, give, just give them like a bit more of an appreciation and like get rid of those those underlying expectations a little bit. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you this as a, a final question. And I think cool. you've kind of teed it up perfectly with um, bringing it back to perspective. With these experiences that you've had, it's almost like quite a quite young age in terms of your adult life, mm. all these experiences you've had over the past decade or so. Um, I'll tie it in with this, what I've written down. I remember I, I posted um, kind of like an inspirational uh, reel on Instagram a few months ago. And it was it was actually Drake, the uh, who was the the voice in the background speaking yeah. on it. He was talking about uh, how he looks at life and thinks about everything he's building, his legacy, and then um, every, you know everything he's doing, everything he's accomplishing, including raising his uh, son. And then he thinks about what comes next, basically when we pass on. And does it all go, is it all for nothing? Does it all just go black? And you commented, I think it all goes black. But I don't think that means it's for nothing. I wanted to ask you off of that. I've got, I've got down here what drives you to to live the life that you do. But I think I know. I think we we know that now mm. um, from from everything you uh, we've discussed in this conversation. So I'll I'll phrase it as this really. Yeah, when, when you look when you look at life, what's most important, and obviously you know the tangible things we know. Uh, family, friends, your partner, your child, but yeah, I I I don't want to ask it the same way I ask it on every podcast. But this is what I'm really asking to be honest. What's the purpose of life? Mm. Yeah, what's the meaning of life? It's Chris Radcliffe. I think. Oh God, it sounds so. It sounds so. Try because I, cause I think you know I do think about this question quite a lot, especially as, you know as you said there. I do think it all goes to black in the end. Um, I'm an atheist, um, and uh, you know we didn't didn't get a chance to have a, have a big uh, debate on religion or anything like that because like I'm I'm curious to sort of you said some bits on like previous episodes of things I'm, I'm curious to like like sort of pick apart like what exactly your beliefs are kind of thing but um in terms of my I, yeah I, I am an atheist I do think it all goes to black in the end but it's it doesn't when when it goes to black for you it doesn't go to black for everyone you still you know the the wheel keeps turning the human race goes on. Yeah, your your the the effects that you've had on the world carry on. You know, you could call it karma or whatever. Um, yeah, the point of life ultimately is to live it. It's as simple as that, really. And the 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 world doesn't sort of necessarily owe you anything in that. And sometimes the life that you're dealt 
and I do believe it's it's like the one life that you dealt, and sometimes you can be dealt a really shit hand. You know, you can be born in some like war torn village in the in the Congo, or you can be born as um, someone that uh, you may not have for whatever reason, like the like the reasoning skills that allows you to like rationalize why like why things are the way they are like um th this is a big thing this is another kind of um jordan peterson s thing uh, actually uh he's talked a bit about um uh he, you know he talks about like personality traits and things like that and um conscientiousness is one and uh intelligence is sort of like a part of that so that's like boiled down to like iq an IQ exists on a on like a bell curve, so like most people are around around the average, and you get it to like tail off the other end. And um, society is like perfect for people um, on on this side of the the bell curve. It's like it's built for it. Not everyone yeah. succeeds. Not everyone succeeds who's who's on that side. Um, but if you like a hundred IQ or higher, like society works for you. It makes sense, and and it works. Even you can still do quite a lot of things if you have like an IQ of like 80. You start going down lower than that. You're talking about the bottom sort of like 20% of the, of the population. Like the, the world can be a bit of a mystery to you and really, really hard work to, to navigate. And that's not your fault. You, you don't know why. And, um, you know, that IQ figure... You know, there's various controversies with that. You know, some people think that you can like increase it and stuff like that, but I think it's fairly accepted that the the majority of of that that value, whatever it is, however you want to quantify it and, and read it, um, there is there is this like bell curve that exists, and there is this this tail end on the on the left side of it of people that are born and there's a genetic component to it that means that they aren't as intelligent and like the world isn't sort of like built for them or modern society isn't isn't built for them very well oh i think that's the key modern society is not built for yeah, them. yeah yeah and and uh, yeah they might if uh, you put them in in another context historical or or just like a different kind of society maybe they'd thrive you know in a, in a different way but yeah mo modern society doesn't work for them and like they've been dealt shit hand um but like for yourself you want to live life and i think a big part of that life is trying to be of service and help those people all across the spectrum whoever they are you know i would say help those a little bit more than need that need that help more and um you know but give a little bit of time for yourself as well but going back to what we talked about before having that perspective not taking yourself too seriously don't expect that your life needs to be part of some grand narrative that's the story of which is going to last for a thousand years yeah you're not fucking achilles or whatever you know what i mean as much as people really want to be it's like just just chill man just chill like it's all right Every, everything everything's all right and when you know and when things aren't all right like hopefully they'll get all right and hopefully you'll have someone there to um to pick you up and like like and i feel for those people that that's that's not the case for which is is a lot of people but if you're, you're in a okay place like appreciate that because things aren't okay for a lot of people like life life doesn't necessarily owe you anything um it's kind of, you know, it seems like a kind of semi-bleak view, but to me, it's also quite hopeful as well um, that th this is this is your one life, this is your one chance. Yeah. So, so live it, do, like do it, do what you want. Don't let don't let the bullshit like hold you back. Um, but again, don't let that make you think that your life means something grander than, than it does. Like we're amazing. Human beings are amazing. 
pinnacle of intelligent life on this planet. You know, you go anywhere around the, the world, you find people. You, there's, there's no other animals. They're all pretty like niched in evolutionarily, aren't they? You know, people are everywhere. Like we're, we're pretty amazing. So you know, just like appreciate that. In that vein, actually, I got you. Um, got you a little Christmas gift. Oh. Yeah. You wouldn't give me so much already. I've got this. Yeah, I know, I know. This I know. hat and the mince pies. So, because um, I know you've spoken about. Oh, wow. um, this is actually my coffee that, that I'm giving oh, to you. Wow. So I didn't. So I didn't spend. <laughs> I didn't yeah. spend anybody. Well, that, that's even more special. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, wow. I think so as well. Yeah. Sometimes I've been given books, and it's like actually the person's coffee yeah. that means more, no, doesn't it? Yeah. That means so a lot. Um, one of the, as we were talking about before, about the uh, the horsemen's of the horsemen of atheism the atheist movement one of them is richard dawkins and this is his book unweaving the rainbow so it's uh, a book uh, in which he um sort of talks about different scientific phenomena that are often ascribed to sort of like superstitious and and mythological things and sort of explains why it's actually more amazing when you look at it scientifically and this isn't me saying no, like, no, no, no. like yeah, you yeah. need this yeah, yeah. because you're a religious, yeah. you're a religious <laughs> I'm a religious nut. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, not at all. But like, I, I got a lot out of reading this book yeah, and, no, I, and I hope that absolutely. you will as well. Uh, I'm blown away, man. Like, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's, no, no, uh, yeah, that's amazing, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give you a big embrace. One sock. Yeah, turn the camera <laughs> off and get over the other side of the table. Yeah, Chris, um, Thank you so much for, for coming on. Uh, like I said, there's a Appreciate lot that we didn't get to talk about. Yeah, I, I'd love to have you back on. I want to have you back on at some point. So we I'd can love get to be back on, man. That as well, maybe coincide it with uh, just before your your uh, pro debut, hopefully. Yeah, uh, yeah. At some point during yeah. next year. But I think it takes a lot of courage to speak about the things that you spoke about today. I learned so much and have so much to go away and think about. And, and uh, yeah, I kind of pay thanks to. Um, for, for what I have, and I think uh, anyone that's listened to this um, would agree with me on that. So thank you. I'm going to say it Thanks again: so like you are a modern day stoic, and um, for that, you're, you're a big inspiration to me. So thank you, Chris. Cheers, I man. really appreciate it. Thanks that. so much. Really kind words. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs>